recorded live. Hi, everybody. It's March the 2nd, 2017, and it's time for my private audio call. Tonight, our special guest speaker is Gene Keating. You've heard him before. It's been a long time, but I'm glad you made it. Hi, Gene. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm glad uh, you came on. I was worried. I didn't hear back from you um, not with email or by phone, and I kept calling you, and you just don't pick up, do you? Well, when did you call? I think I've called you uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, well, probably the day before it, that. I may not be near the phone. If I'm not near the phone, I don't answer. I also sent you two or three texts. You sent them by email? No, by phone. Well, I probably didn't get them then if you sent them by phone. <laughs> I guess not. Do you have a cell but phone? But anyway, what? Do you have a cell phone? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's why. That's what you called me on was my cell phone. Yeah, but I don't have I don't have a cell phone. Oh, you don't? No, this is a oh, okay. landline. Oh, okay. Then I guess you didn't get my text. No. Uh, I also sent you two emails. Yeah, I got the email, but I didn't get the the text. From the <laughs> well, then why didn't you email me back and say, okay, I'll be there, don't worry. Well, I got, I've got your email, but I didn't get the text from the cell phone. I don't have a cell phone. Okay, but when I sent you the email, I was a reminder about our call for tonight. A, a response would have been good. I was worried the whole time. Anyway, all right, let's get beyond that. What's new, and what are you going to tell us about? Well, we, uh, everybody talks about redemption, but nobody knows how to do it right. It isn't redemption. It's, it's a tax issue. Everything is a tax because there's no money. And people don't understand what money is. There hasn't been any money since 1933. What they're doing is using your, uh, everything is a ta- is credit or, ta- or tax issue. And nobody c- claims the, the taxes and they don't know how to do it. But the problem is, people do the OID. They don't know enough about Class 5 gift and state taxes. That's what everything is. That's what the problem is. People I thought we do. got beyond OIDs. I didn't think people were doing them anymore because they weren't doing anything for anybody. Well, they don't know how to do them. They don't even know what an OID is. You show me one person that can tell me what an OID is, by definition. You can't even find me anybody that knows what it is. How can you do an OID if you don't know what it is? Yeah, I don't know. I don't file at all, so I don't do any of that stuff. Well, then how are you going to get your uh, how are you going to get your money back then? I never paid anything in. Do you pay? Do you pay uh, utility bills? Yeah. Well, that's an OID. You pay uh, credit card. Do you use a credit card? No. How do you pay, how do you how do you purchase food and clothing? Cash, cash. I have an ATM. You know, a, a debit card. Well, then you have a credit card. That's what a debit well, card. Okay. The only difference between a credit card and a debit card is the, the debit card, they go right into your bank bank account and take it out. Well, on I don't have a bank card, account. They, on the credit card, they bill you for it. Right. They're both the same. Okay. Credit cards are investment contracts, just like uh, I've got a prospectus with a credit card agreement on it from Visa. The Visa borrows credit from 12 different banks and then they forward your 
credit card payments to banks as cash flow claims. So they're the borrower on the credit. Visa is. I have a copy of the Visa credit card agreement from the SEC website that says that. Then they set up a, De a Delaware statute forward the cash flow payment uh, uh, to uh, to investors as, as cash flow claims. And they get out of paying taxes because they formed a Delaware statutory trust. And they do what they call a 1031 exchange, which means that you, if you read that, it's in Title 26, Section 1031. They exchange uh, uh, credits for credits or debits for debits, but that's not what they're really doing. They, that's just a front. It's like they went from securitization to Delaware Statutory Trust. They used to use uh, securitization, which is off-balance sheet financing, which means they, re they, re they remove the entries, the bookkeeping entries, from their balance sheet. If you know what's a balance sheet, the balance sheet is the statement of assets and liabilities, or payments and, and liabilities. They're the the uh, if they're if they're uh, if, if they're uh, credits, you have two two sides of the accounting ledger. You have a liability and an asset column. If it's a payable or a receivable, payables are assets to the depositor, and receivables are liabilities to the depositor. Uh, receivables are assets to the bank and liabilities to the depositor. And you can't have a liability where you don't have any money. So it's all a tax issue. And what do I mean by tax issue? It's income. It tells you when they send you a bill, it tells you how much of your income they're using. And, you, and nobody ever claims the income, so they get away with it. So you send them money, and they, they forward the money that you send them to investors as cash flow claims. None of the money that you send to these people pays for anything. That That's not hypothetical or conjectural. It's concrete and eminent. I can prove it that that's what they right. In fact, if you go to the PIMCO bond website, it tells you right on the, you know who PIMCO bond is, bonds are? Mm -hmm. I doubt if anybody even knows who PIMCO is. I've been to their website. Okay, that's the U.S. arm of Allianz SE out of Munich, Germany. And it says right on their website that they forward your mortgage payments as cash flow claims to investors. So you're not making payments on a mortgage, you're making payments on, on an investment contract. And if you read your deed of trust, it has a third 30-year maturity. It says that on the note. And if you go to 15 U.S.C. 78 C.A. 10, it says any no, all notes are securities, except those with a maturity of nine months or less. That's the exclusion rule. So the only securities that are notes are notes with a maturity of nine months or less. All notes have a maturity of 30 years or more. I've seen them as low as 12 months. Then it goes to 15, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. But they're all securities, they're not notes. And all securities are governed by Article 8, not Article 3. There, and it says that in 4-102 under applicability. It says that if it's an item that's includable in Article 3 and it's governed by 8, 8 controls 3 and 4. And if there's a conflict, 8 controls 3 and 4. Article 4 does, uh, deals with transfers and deposits in banks. Article 3 deals with negotiable instruments. But you're not dealing with a negotiable instrument. A security is a non-negotiable instrument. 
It's a financial asset. Go read 8-102, subsection 5. Financial assets, not a negotiable instrument. So you're giving them a security and they sell it to investors. Then they forward your cash flow claims to the investors. That's Have you done not, this yourself? Well, yeah, I, I, I went into court, argued this in a courtroom, and uh, we were doing a telephonic, uh, this is on a mortgage foreclosure case. I was in the courtroom live talking to the judge face to face about this, and I was arguing, I was saying this very thing. That I'm saying now to the court. And the attorney was on the phone. This is a woman attorney. You know what she said to the judge? Be careful what you say to this guy. He knows more than you think he, think he does. <laughs> what does that tell you? I guess the judge knows you fairly well. Well, the, she was acknowledging that I knew what I was talking about. I've talked to this woman on the phone. All these attorneys, everybody goes in there and argues. Nobody goes in there and says, I was never loaned any money. I can prove that nobody was ever loaned any money. In fact, I can prove that there never there isn't any money. And if you read your deed of trust, it's, it says that it's not payable until maturity. And any delinquency in payment can be paid at maturity. Well, what is the maturity? It's a 30-year maturity, so that means it's a note. It's a note security. It's not a note. It's a security by rule of statutory construction. If you go read, uh, if you go read uh, uh, the exclusion rule and the rule of statutory construction, it, if it's included in the definition of a security, it's excluded from the definition of a note, and conversely. But what I'm telling you is a, a note cannot be both a note and a security. So if it's, if it's excluded from the definition of a note, it's not governed by Article 3, and that's what 4-102 under applicability says. It's not a negotiable instrument. It's a financial asset. So nobody goes in there and denies that they ever received the loan. I have an actual money net daily transaction log report that was issued under the U.S. Patriot Act and the Bank Secrecy Act. And under SEC rules, uh, uh, this covers this this. This applies to all brokers that do brokering. Uh, under the SEC rules, they have to file a, C, they're called currency money instrument reports, CMIRs is what they're called. They're called FinCEN reports. And they have to show who the source bank is that funded the loan transaction and secured the, the debtor's borrower's property. They never do that. I have an actual, one of my clients from up in Sacramento sent me a, a money net data transaction log report, and it shows that the homeowner was the, was the lender. And guess what they put down as the, as the uh, bank, bank account number? The Social Security number is a bank account number. Mm. I can prove to anybody that I can tell you what bank your, your account is in and how much is in the bank account. So what well, they're doing it. is they're it, it, mate, you want to remember since thirty three everybody's all everybody on the public side is bankrupt. They're debtors in possession under Chapter 11 reorganization, acting as trustees to the bankrupt estate. John Trafficant said that in the congressional record. I understand he got murdered here recently. They put him in prison for six years. But what he did was he, he said that we, we're going through the biggest Chapter 11 reorganization in the history of the United States. We're in a declared state of bankruptcy, so how can banks loan money? 
If you read uh, the National Bank Act or the National Currency Act of June 3rd, 1864, Section 8, banks can only loan credit based on security. And Section 35 says they can't loan their deposits as collateral for the for, for the for a, for a mortgage loan. Well, if they can't use their own uh, capital as collateral for a loan, where the hell are they getting the money from? By lending it. They can't. What are they lending? Well, that's what it says on the uh, uh, yeah, website. Yeah, a loan that I have received. You notice that none of the nobody from the bank signs any of the loan documents. And under the statute, if you read your statute of frauds, it says that that it has to be. If you have a contract between two parties, both parties have to sign the contract in order for it to be binding. It has to be in writing, subscribed to, it has to be in writing and subscribed to by the person being charged. Well, the bank never signs anything. That's because there's no contract. And if there's no contract, there never was a loan. Another thing, if you read your uh, deed of trust or your note, they both have it in there. It says that they loaned you, for a loan that I have received, I promise to pay back uh, 240000 U.S. dollars. Ask anybody on this call what U.S. means. I bet there isn't one person on this call that can answer that. What does it mean? Then. Units of silver, Spanish mill dollar, ab adop adopted and implemented into the Coinage Act of 1792. 23.25 grams is a dollar of gold. Mm -hmm. And a certain grainage, if you use standard or troy ounces, a certain grainage of silver, I think it's 416.5, I don't know if it's troy or standard been a while since I looked at that, but a certain grainage of silver is a dollar of silver. So a dollar is a unit of measurement. It's an intangible. It's not a tangible. So you have, so what does that tell you? You have a gold clause. And what does HJR 192 say? Codified to 31 USC 5118 D2. It says, it is hereby declared to be against public policy for any contract or obligation to contain a clause that purports to give the obligee the right to demand payment in any Pacific coin or currency of the United States. Well, aren't they demanding payment in a Pacific coin or currency of the United States? Yeah. Yes. Federal Reserve notes. No, they're not. They're demanding lawful money. You know, it's the silver. That's a gold but they clause. But they don't take it. What do you mean they don't take it? If you go to make your mortgage payment with gold or silver, they won't take it at the bank. That's because gold and silver is no longer money. Uh, gold and silver will always be money. No. No, it's not. It's a commodity now. Well... As long as people taking it and exchanging it for stuff. Well, who's using? As long gold as they call. I, I mean, using if they're saying, if, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. If there's, if you're saying that a dollar is so many grains of silver, and that paper dollar is just a, like a receipt for the silver, but you can't go anywhere and redeem that dollar for the silver, so and you yeah, can't. Yeah. Yeah, but that's why it's payable at maturity. Because 30 years from now, you're going to have money. How? That's how I got. they got around the prohibition of public policy. It's not payable until, uh, until 30 years from, from the date it was issued, which is maturity. It says any delinquency can be paid on January 1st, 2037.
What does that tell you? You can't have a contract with a gold clause in it. So to get around that, they made it a futures contract. A futures contract doesn't violate public policy. What is public policy? Bankruptcy. So to get around the, the prohibition of the gold clause, they made it a futures contract. They made it payable 30 years from maturity or from, from closing, but, yeah. which, which, which is maturity. If you read any any uh, loan documents, all of the uh, all of them are payable at maturity. I'm gonna have to go over mine again and check that out. Just take my word for it. Nobody nobody reads anything. I haven't met one person in 50 years that's ever read a, a deed of trust. Did well, you know I've read it? it several times, but I'm getting old now. My memory's not so well. So I have to do go read it again. That's because you're dehydrated. Go buy a, a, a turapur, a turapur pitcher with water in it. When you pour tap water into the pitcher, it ionizes, it activates the hydrogen ionized ions, which are protons, and it pushes the water across the membrane or the sigma of the cell. That's how you hydrate the body. You haven't drank any. There is not one store in the United States that sells hydrogen ionized water. You have to make it. What was the name of that? Everybody that drinks water is dehydrated. What did you say I should get? What is it called? Turapur. T-U-R-A-P-U-R. Go go read it. They go into the scientific explanation. It's irrefutable. Well, John Ellis makes a machine that does that. I have a machine. It's a twenty-five hundred dollar machine. It's a, a number five Ellis water machine. What it does is it changes the bond angle of the hydrogen. It separates the hydrogen from the oxygen. You have two atoms of hydrogen and one one atom of oxygen. And he separates the hydrogen from the oxygen. So when you drink the water after it's been vaporized and recondensed, you're drinking hydrogen ionized water, which is protons. And protons are electrical charges. So what you're doing is increasing electrical potential in the body. And it pushes the water across the membrane of the cell and hydrates the cell. Otherwise, you're dehydrated. I'll tell you what, anybody can prove me wrong, I'll buy your picture from you. Sell me your picture. I'll, I'll pay you for, you for your picture. I'm looking at it now. Top water filter systems, tur- Tura Pure Picture, a buyer's guide. Goes into details on what exactly it is. Or you get the best price now. It's $39.95. And you get oh. you, you can buy for eight. I think it's eighteen ninety five. You get six filters with. It. And what they do is they use magnesium to create hydrogen ions in the water, and then the hydrogen ions puts pushes the water. So you got to have electrically charged water to get it across the uh, the membrane of the cell. Otherwise, it doesn't permeate the membrane. You have a membrane which they call the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is what potentializes the cell. If you don't get any water in the cell, you can't get new nutrients into the cell. If you can't get nutrients into the cell, you're dehydrated, and you're suffering from malnutrition. I have a degree, SS degree in nuclear physics, and I can prove everything that I'm saying right, right here. We're getting a little bit off subject, but mm-hmm. I have a degree in physics, and that's what's going on. That's why everybody ages. You're not so getting any nutrients in, into me, the cell. Let me and, ask you this: since you said you're you you've got a degree in nuclear physics, um, have you ever uh, has anyone ever asked you about the simulation theory? No. Okay, then we'll take that. And well, I'll just let's leave it at that, and I'll 
fill you in on it later or look it up. Simulation hypothesis. Okay, and what is it based on? Oh, this professor out of Oxford University, his name is Nick Bostrom. Uh, well, you got to, I can't, you know, I'm not, I'm not into it. I can't, I, I'm not as articulate as I would like to be, but I understand it and I like it and you should read it and see what you think. Well, what, what sum it up in one sentence. What, what is that uh, based on? Uh, the whole, the whole, her whole existence is a based on, is, is a simulation. Yes, I agree with that. Okay. It's a it's a photographic uh, imaging of recorded mind imaging. Everything in the third dimension is optical, and that's where I got my degree. I got my degree from the University of Science and Philosophy. I've been teaching for fifty. I started this back in 1950. I was teaching this stuff. And uh, 1950. Yeah. 1950. How old are you? I'm 77. Wow. Getting up there. And I can do Chinese pull I can do a hundred Chinese push ups. What the Chinese push ups. <laughs> you can't find me one I, I haven't found one person that can do one. What is a Chinese push up with one hand tied behind your back or <laughs> Go get a wheel. You ever seen a wheel where you you roll out? Yeah. You, you know, you put your feet. Show me anybody that can do one of those. There's only a handful of people that can do them. The the wheel that you have in both hands, you have handles, and the wheel goes up and back. Yeah, it's got bearings. The one I have is a, is a real good. It's it's the top. It got a company in Wisconsin makes it. They also make the cables. The cables with with the handles. I've got a, a, a silicon cables that are 300 p- pounds per square inch. Each one, there's three cables. That's 900 pounds per square inch. When I was 60 years old, I could pull all three of them. Well, you must be pounds. in pretty good shape. Well, I, don't, I, I haven't seen you answer. since Vegas. That was a long time ago. That was like 2005, I think. Yeah, I have a pair of hand grips here that are 500 pounds. I've got another one that's a thousand pounds. I can squeeze it halfway shut. It's a thousand pounds. The five hundred I could do ten times. When I was sixty years old, I could squeeze it shut ten times, and I haven't seen anybody in the world that can squeeze it shut once. I called the company that makes it, and they told me there's nobody that can squeeze these shut. So I sent them a picture of me doing it. Then I got uh-huh. in, into legal stuff because I got into a lot of fights. I, I like to fight. I'm a fighter. Well, now, <laughs> make love, not war. Yeah, that's right. You're exactly right. I agree with that. That's the that's the worst thing you can do is get in a fight because you, if you can do if you're tough, you don't have to prove it. Right. And people are controlling you if they lure you into a fight. But we're getting off subject here. But anyway, that's what that's what's going on. Uh, uh, everything is everything in the third dimension is optical. Mm-hmm. It's controlled, yeah. and, and and the only person that teaches the laws of optics is Walter Russell. And Walter Russell was Nikola Tesla's mentor. Wow. And he was mm-hmm. my mentor. So I understand the the the. The, the invisible universe controls the visible. The invisible universe is predicated on the cube. The visible universe is predicated on the sphere. And the, the cube and the sphere have a relationship. If you don't know that relationship, you don't understand anything that's going on. And that's what Russell teaches. And Nikola Tesla got all his a knowledge from Walter Russell. I got a couple of questions. You want to answer a couple of questions? Sure. Okay, first of all, Truth wants to know uh, two questions. One, serve a judge and prosecutor a trust in court? 
And two, how do you claim a court case? All these courts are tax courts. Everything is a tax. How many people know what revenue is? How many revenue? people? Yeah, yeah, revenue. How many people know what venue is? Venue is principal. Revenue is interest. Uh, income is the return. That's why they call it in. There's two words, income. That's the return of venue back to principal. And the principal is the creditor. That's what you do in bookkeeping. You have a payables and a receivable side. That's why I told you under FASB number 95, statement of cash flows. When a loan is made, a, a receipt goes to the depositor and a payment to the bank and a payment to the depositor and a receipt to the bank. So both the bank and the, and the depositor have a payment and a receipt. And they never show you the receipt for the payment because nobody asked for it. If you go read 3-501 of the Uniform Commercial Code, when they make a presentment, if a payment's been made, you have to ask them for, the re for a receipt for the payment or a surrender of the instrument. Nobody does that. I can show you a Florida case where a woman gave a guy a note, borrowed money on it, then paid the loan off, and the guy took, because she never asked for the note back or surrender of the instrument, he, he tendered the note to another to another bank for a loan, and he defaulted on that loan, and they held her responsible for it and took all her property because she, because she didn't demand surrender of the note. And you can't show me one person that's ever asked for the surrender of the note. That's because the loan was paid for at closing. If you read 1813L1 of Title 12, when a, when a note, a promissory note, deposit it into a demand deposit account, it becomes the equivalent of money or cash. And that's what they do. They actually, what they do is MIRS, who's Mortgage Electronic Registration Systems, Inc., they shred your note, your original note. That's why everything is under the Electronic Transfer Act and Electronic Registration Act. They make an electronic instrument out of it, then they make they make a dozen copies of the original note, and then they take your signature and endorse it because you gave them power of attorney. That's why if you read your deed of trust, it says it, it talks about a, a power, when the loan goes into default, uh, they can exercise the power of sale. That's why they do a non-judicial judicial foreclosure in California. And if you read 1131 through 1134 of the California Code of Civil Procedure, it tells you you have to have an affidavit, or they call it a, in Movie A's Law Dictionary, they call it a warrant of an attorney. It's an affidavit signed by the borrower, the homeowner, and the attorney have to sign it. Then they have to record it with the county recorder's office. Then they have to record it with the county clerk's office. The, it, the county clerk's office, and then with the clerk of the court. That's how you bind. The, if the guy knows that, that when the loan goes into default, they can do, they can sell the property without a degree, decree, judgment, or order of the court. If you read 2924 of the California Civil Code, it says they can't exercise the power of sale without a decree, order, or judgment of a court of record. Where's the, where is the decree, order, or judgment of a court of record on a non-judicial foreclosure? It's a confessed judgment. If you go into the early 1900 California real estate laws, it tells you that when you sign a deed of trust, you give them power of sale, and a power of sale is a confessed judgment. And it's illegal in California. Every state has outlawed confessed judgments except New York City. How many people know that? I never heard that before. Confessed judgment? Right. They call it a cognovit note. Go look up cognovit. You want me to spell that for you? C O G N O V I T. Cognovit note.
This is the type of stuff that I go over in my class. Oh, you know what? I wanted to ask you about that because I remember you used to have classes on Wednesday, right? Yeah, we have them on Tuesday nights at, at 6 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard. How, how would someone sign up for that if they wanted to? Uh, let me give you the uh, the email. I've got somebody, Brian Waite, hand, handles my my class. Is that the same guy that you had before? No. Okay. All right. What is it? Hang on. I got to go into my emails because he handles all this. I don't. I don't have time because I'm too busy doing research and. That's Tuesday night, 6 p.m.? Yes. The email is jvkclass at t-u-t-a-n-o-t-a dot com, C-O-M. Okay, let me read it back to you. J as in John. B is in Victor, K no, is in B is in boy. John, so J. You want me to spell it phonetically? It's Joy, Barry, Kilo, Car, Larry, Alpha, Sam, Sam. Okay, at, so go ahead. At, at T, Tom, Uniform, Tom. Alpha, November, Oscar, two, alpha dot com. So it's tutanota dot com, which is spelled T U T A N O T A dot com. You know, you make this so stupid and so ridiculous. How is anybody supposed to find you? Why would you make it that difficult for people to to sign up for your class? That's ridiculous. It's like Italian. Well, I didn't. Uh, that's that's uh, Brian's email. Jesus. Okay, so let me read it back. I put it in the in the in the chat here. J B. K class at Tutano. No, 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 no. It's J B K class. C A. J B K class. Yeah, at C L A S S at Tutanota dot com. That's just his email. He sends oh, out sh- classes. He sends out all the notices and everything after you make. Okay, Janine, you got it. What? Janine put it in there. You got it right, Janine. Tuta nota. It's like Italian. Jesus, this is America for crying out loud. It should be real simple. It well, should be yeah. Dean, well, yeah, Dean's class, right? At whatever, at Proton Mail or Gmail. Gene's class, you know? Real easy. I get so frustrated. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. I get, you ought to see the emails I get. Anti-disestablishment antarianism. Oh, God. Well, don't anybody pay attention to the way I posted it in the chat. Janine's got it right, so you copy Janine's. God. Well, here, I'll I'll, I'll copy it from Janine and repost it, so. <laughs> Ridiculous. All right. Continue. I'm sorry. I got frustrated there. Well, what were we? We were talking about. Uh, uh, I have the classes. Sometimes they go until midnight. They're twenty five dollars per class, okay. and sometimes we go until, until you drop off the planet again, right? Until you're no longer found and you're gone, right? Do you know how many emails I've gotten from people? How do we get a hold of Gene? What happened to the classes? You know, and I'm stuck answering all these emails. It, why well, do you do let me give you my email. Well, I've got your email now, but you didn't answer it, so what good is it? Well, the email I got, I think, came in today. 
Well, I sent it to you a couple of days ago. Maybe you need a new server or something. I don't know. Well, Google, yeah, go, Google Chrome is terrible. <sighs> We've got uh, four people lined up with questions. Truth, was that your? Did you did did you answer Truth's questions? There was two of them there. Serve a judge and prosecutor a trust in court. How do you claim? Kind of, why do you want to? Well, let me ask you the. Let me ask you two questions. What kind of trust are you using, and why are you serving a trust on the judge? I don't know. Truth, you want to come on and. <laughs> you want to come on and answer. Uh, let me find her. Hold on. There's so many, like 200 people on this call, Gene. So hold on a second. Uh, Truth, where are you, darling? I'm looking, I'm looking. Oh, I'm an OPQRS. T. Oh, she's gone. She's, oh, here she is. She's on the Skype. Ask Gene to, okay. Claiming the court case, expressing the trust, she said. Are you talking about the trust estate? You know what, Truth? You're going to have to come on the call. I can't do this. This is not working. I can't be the middleman here because I don't know what you're trying to express. So come on the call, my dear, and I'll unmute you. In the meantime, she's Southeast She's trying to Texas, do something. Uh, it sounds like she doesn't uh, understand what she what she's doing. Well, she's typing it into Skype, and it's kind of hard to understand. Star 8, yeah, Star 8. Okay, Southeast uh, Texas. Oh. Go ahead, Southeast Texas. You've been unmuted. Okay, I've, I sent you a couple of emails. You said you sent you sent back their emails. I didn't get any. Uh, this, there, there's other people having trouble with emails, too. I sent Truth an email. She sent me back something about a Jay Costa or something like that, and I emailed him. I hadn't heard back from him. But anyway, I just wanted you to know I sent you two emails. It says, sent again. Sent again. Okay, what would you uh, ask me for? Is Truth's documents, the, the, the yeah, link? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, they're on the that. website now. I well, mean, you can get them off the website. I checked, I checked them uh, yesterday, and they weren't there for me, you know. Okay, well, check again. Okay. That's all refresh, for me. Refresh your browser. They're at the top of Truth's webpage on the far right at the top, and it says, you know, what they are. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, we got a question for Jean. Mike, go ahead. You've been unmuted. Hi, Mike. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, I had a question about uh, what type of law you were using, like uh, you're using what administrative or uh, UCC or what, cause, uh, to to talk about with the the money thing. You mean the uh, when you when you say the money thing, what do you what are you referring? You to? know, like you're saying, because there's no money. So I just want to clarify which type. Like where you're getting that from? Because where, because where I come from, you know, anything that you exchange is money. No, it isn't. You, you know what they use as money today? What? I'll, 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 I'll argue your case for you. They use debt. Debt is money, and that's what an OID. Is. An OID is a is evidence of indebtedness. If you read twelve seventy five and twelve seventy five original issue discount. Yeah. Under yeah. Title twenty six, if you read twelve seventy four and twelve seventy five, evidence of indebtedness is is an original issue discount. Yeah. Okay. And you don't have to file a t here's where everybody screws up. You don't have you, you know what the, how much of an exclusion you have as of 2017 as under under as under a state law? What's that? It's a class five gift and a state tax. You okay. have a unified tax credit on the gift side and a unified state a unified state tax credit on the state side. You know how much those are? How much? 
You got a five million four hundred and thirty four four hundred and ninety thousand as of twenty seventeen. And if you go read twenty six USC twenty ten, it tells you you got a five million. The okay. plan is is five million, but they've raised it four hundred and ninety thousand. So you got five million four hundred and ninety thousand on the estate side. And that's therefore that means that you have to make over since you've got a, a, a class five gift in a state and the decedent is the truster of the trust estate, you have a unified tax credit of five million. So you have to make over five million four hundred and ninety thousand before you're required to file a tax return. You know who does all the bookkeeping on a on a tax issue? Some man or woman. No, the Secretary of the Treasury does. Okay. Yeah, I heard about that part. I heard about that person. The Secretary of Treasury, he's like actually a real like powerful guy. He's like more powerful than the president or something. Well, he runs the he's the governor of the International Monetary Fund. Plus he's the Secretary of the Treasury. Yeah. Well, so if you send him something, he credits the account. If you do a payment order, which is a payable, what you have to do is send him a payable to zero out the receivable. You have to understand how bookkeeping is done. In 1970, the United States was bankrupt. Every bank was in a state of liquidation. And what they did is they removed, they moved all the receivables over into the assets and balanced the books. Okay. That's why everything is a, is a tax issue. It's not a money issue, it's a tax issue. Everybody that goes into court argues uh, money, and there is no money. And what I mean by money, if you read the Uniform Commercial Code, it doesn't define what money is. I usually you try to not be, to do you the don't code. You have to have a fifth grade level of education to understand how are the states going to not violate Article 1, Section 10 if there's no money. Article 1, Section 10 says that no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts. How are you going to pay well, your debts when there's no money? Well, how do you call it? I don't need the education to know about the UCC. It's just an interpretation of some law anyway. So, I mean, that's, you know. Well, no, I did, I that. you know what the uniform cursor, you know what the uniform commercial code is? The indicative of the federal common law of admiralty. Yeah, predictive. Yeah, indicative of the, yeah. And when you well, common law of admiralty, money, that would be English. When you go under Article Two and sell yeah. money, you do a sale under contract. You know what money becomes a commodity. It becomes goods and a commodity under two dash one hundred five. And nobody goes into court and argues the right issue. They all go in there and argue money. When you start arguing money, you admit that you were loaned, loaned the, the bank loaned you money. I, I, I've read a decision by a judge. He says, nobody's ever come into my court and denied that they received money on a loan. Okay, I'm done. I'm done, Angela. All right, thank you. thank you. All right, next up, Great Gazoo. Go ahead, you've been unmuted. Hi, Angela, thank you. Uh, hello, Dean. You're welcome. How are you doing? Good, good. Um, I've been looking for you for a long time, man. I, I read your uh, prison treaties, and that it just blew me away. But anyway, you said that the... That the the power company sends you the bill, and I what are they really? It to the Secretary of Treasury, and he takes care of the bookkeeping. But would you endorse the back pay to the order of the United States without recourse? Well, you don't have to do it without recourse because they don't have any recourse. Their job is right. you know, to pay to the order of the Secretary of the Treasury and charge the account. See, what you're doing is. When, it, when somebody sends you a bill, if it's a utility company, what they're telling you is how much of your credit they're using. So you charge their account 
for the for for the money. And you can call it money because that's what they do. You can charge them for the sum set. Just use the sum set. They're claiming that you owe a receivable. Receivables are what's owed to, to whoever's demanding payment. Payables are what the what the uh, what they owe you. So what I do is I could I convert the receivable into a payable by making it a bill. It's called a bill of exchange. Go read the Bills of Exchange Act of 1896. It's actually 1890. And then what they did is they, the law merchant existed before then. See, in the, in, the, in the old times, and this goes clear back to ancient Mesopotamia and Sumeria, what they did is they did, under the law merchant, when they went to, they, they, they call them courts of powder puree, clay courts. They would meet at the end of the year. They would give each other receipts for anything that they borrowed for payment of goods. They would give them a receipt. Then at the end of the year, they would meet and pay all of their receipts in gold and silver, lawful money. Let me, let me tell you another thing that nobody understands. I've talked to a dozen attorneys. In fact, I flunked 12 attorneys. I tried to hire 12 attorneys to represent clients in court. They were so stupid, I, I couldn't even, I wouldn't even entertain hiring them. They don't know anything about commercial law. And, and judges, attorneys do not understand the law merchant. When you do a transfer or an assignment under the law merchant, it constitutes a payment. If you read Gordon versus Wangsey, which is the California Supreme Court decision in 1862, when you do when you transfer or assign a instrument or a note, what you call a note, it constitutes a payment and discharges the original drawer and maker. And the proof of that is that they endorse it without recourse. And if you read without what, what without recourse means under 3 413, 414, and 415, it discharges the original drawer and maker. Because whoever puts their endorsement on the instrument under 3 413 becomes an acceptor. Go read what an acceptor is. He becomes liable to the original obligor. Excuse me, obligee. Which is the bank. So he, he that's the reason they endorse it without recourse because they don't want to become liable on their signature. So they just what they did is they did an unauthorized material alteration of the original instrument and they discharged the original drawer and maker. And that's what three dash four fourteen and three dash four fifteen says. And another thing, nobody nobody reads the remi. If you go in and pull which is a conduit loan. If you go in and pull the REMIC, and I'll use mine, because I have a case I'm in court with right now. The Seawall Alternative Loan Trust 2007-OA7. It says that what the, what the pooling and servicing agreement says is that the, that the when a loan goes into default, the, the defaulted loan has to be replaced with a performing loan. In other words, a recourse loan. You can't put a non-recourse loan into an, uh, a REMIC, a real estate mortgage investment conduit. And the reason is because nobody can get paid on it. And I'll demonstrate it this way. If I give you a check and I, write, and I endorse it as a drawer and maker without recourse and the check bounces, you cannot come after me for the money. What you did by accepting the the note or the the check is you waived the right to payment. Yeah. Because it's now a non-recourse instrument. You can't get payment from me. I signed it. I'm the payor, and you're the payee. If I if I endorse the check to you. And you, and you endorse it for payment, and the check bounces, and I endorse it without recourse, you cannot get paid from me. You can't come after me for the money. Well, you look at all these mortgage loans. Every mortgage loan is endorsed without recourse. In fact, I can show you where they don't do a blank endorsement. They, they make a payee out of it. They actually type in the name of the – they got a payee on there. That means they got paid. 
not only are they getting paid by the by the instrument, but they're get they're they're double dipping. Then they go get they got paid by the insurance company because the loan was because it was endorsed without recourse, it was never transferred to the REMIC, so that was in de default on the conduit loan, which was taken out by the by the servicing company. And now you've got a note that's non performing and that can't be collected on or negotiated because it's endorsed without recourse. Yeah. So basically, they we should all just be long. we should be demanding the receipt up front as soon as we sign it, and the guy takes it back, and you say, well, "I need a receipt for that, and right. I need to." You need not only do, you need to demand a receipt or surrender of the instrument. Go read three right. dash five hundred one. It says if, if payment would have been made and you have a court and satisfaction under 3-311, you have to ask for a receipt for the payment or a surrender of the instrument. And nobody does that. Okay. And, and for the utility, do, is, should we set up a cover letter or something to let the Treasury no, know that we know? A, I don't give them any, any cover letter. I just endorse. I take the... What I do is I use uh, Acrobat Pro DC, and you can do it with, they have a free one, it's called PDF 24, that, that one of my students says does the same thing. I paid almost $200 for the, uh, uh, for my rendition, but what it does is it converts the instrument, makes the, what I do is take the coupon from the bill, Tear off the mm -hmm. bottom of the coupon, and then I type type in my payment order, and then I sign it in red ink. I've got an actual practice from the IRS that says everything has to be signed with red ink. You know why? Because in I'd like to see that. Where do you have that? Can I get a copy of that? I'd have to. Do where that. is it? But I I used to show that I used to show that it actually says that in the IRS practice manual. Where does it say that? That it has to be signed in red ink. No, but where All in the book? All signatures in the Internal Revenue Code has to be signed with red ink. You know why? Because red ink. What they used to do in ancient times is they would prick their finger, put blood into a with alcohol into a, and they use the quill. They use they use a quill for a pen. In other words, they'd take a feather and, and take the sh sharpen the end of the quill and dip it in the blood, and they would sign their signature in b red blood to show that they were a live person. You know how I got out of all this? If you look up the word decedent, in Chapter 11 and Chapter 12 of Title 26, it talks about a decedent. I said, well, this guy isn't dead. Why are they referring to a decedent? Well, this, well it, this is in the uh, IRS practice manual. Here, I'll give you a – hang on. Let me give you the uh, – I want to be sure I give this the, the right uh, – this is in the IRS manual. Still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Are you looking for it? Yeah. Got it. Just be a second here and I'll have it. I love pineapple. Yeah, that, that would be really useful because they always presume that you're lost and presume here, dead. Here's what it says. It well, says, give me the link. Is there a link to it, or? Well, let me let me give you the manual number. Just type this in. Okay. It's it's twenty one point seven point thirteen point two point two point three, and this is January sixth, twenty fourteen. 
January 6th, 2014. And it says, hey. it, it says date of death, check. <laughs> and here's what, here's what it says. Okay. Hello? Yeah, let me, let me, uh, I'm, I'm, looking, oh. I'm looking for the, uh, the code. La 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 da 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 <laughs> It's too much quiet, Jean. Okay, here it is. Here's what it says. I'm gonna pr- I'm gonna quote it verbatim. I'm not I, I'm quoting this directly from the from that code section I just gave you. Okay, an good. Infant, an infant is the decedent of an estate or grantor owner custodian or truster of a trust, guardianship, receivership, or custodianship that has yet to receive an SSN number. So if you give them your Social Security number, that means you're not a decedent. Because the decedent hasn't received an SS number yet. You notice it says a decedent is an infant because he has the age of majority. Now this is from the IRS. This is the IRS saying this. This is not me saying that. Okay, so you're civilly dead until you reach age of majority. Right. So you reach age of majority, and you can't be an owner. That's why. And another thing is, if you go into, and uh, if you go into my, uh, well, I have a website, Gene Keating uh, School of Law. Is the name of the website, but you got to type it into the bar, a bar up there, the search bar. If you type it into Google, it will not come up. Dean Keating read, School of Law. Yeah, if you read that, it goes into the whole thing about Admiralty Mar- why everything is under Admiralty Maritime Law. Most comprehensive thing you've ever read. Is that all one word? Yeah, Gene, yeah, it's Gene Keating School of Law. Is that dot com or dot net? No, just Gene Keating School of Law. Let me double check that because I had somebody set this up for me. I didn't set this up. I had somebody set it up for me. But all the information in there is my information. Freedom School. That looks like it. Gene Keating material. Is Gene. Keating's with an S. It's Gene Keating, oh. plural, S, Laws, Law School. It's lawschool.com. It does have a dot .com on it. So it's Gene Keating's lawschool.com. Lawschool. That's not, okay. Uh, wait a minute. Gene Keating's, God, Gene Keating's, what else? Lawschool.com. Lawschool. All all that's all one word. Okay. If you read that treatise, it's... Because I just came off of one that was asking for donations. (laughs) <laughs> but I guess that's not you. Okay, this one's a blue page. Yeah, okay. Gene Keating Law. Gene yeah. Keating, Lawyer for the People. All right. Jesus. Could they could they make the type a little smaller, Gene? Well, you can bo- just blow it up a little bit. 
Yeah, yeah we've got to do that. Yeah, I guess it, whoever put this, I didn't. Put, I put the treatise together, but this is my uh, treatise. But if, if you read, uh, if you it's read, it's not even black. The the text is in gray, a dark gray or something. It's not even black. Why do people make it so difficult to read? I don't. I, well, I'm mine's so in frustrated. black. I don't know where you're at. Mine, all of mine is in black. Well, it's a light black. It's not black, black. And it's on I a can, blue background. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I can read it perfectly. In fact, just, oh, you've got better use, eyes than me. Use your mouse and just highlight everything yeah. as you read it. Yeah, I always got to do it. The, uh, what the bird, what the, uh, Birth certificate is a certificate of documentation. Isn't it first certificate? Uh, Alex Rodia, which is out, which came out of Greece, was written by women. That's why all vessels in Admiralty are, have a female name. I heard that when someone she, say that the when, uh, she delivered, when she delivered the cargo. At the port of entry, which is the hospital, through the through the uh, the port of entry, which is the hospital. That's why they use it in all capital letter names. If you go into Admiralty, all vessels are spelled in all capital letter names. It's a go read twelve dash one hundred star uh, in, in, in uh, title. You three. just you know what you got stepped on. You said go read what. Title 46, Section 12-1101, so parenthesis 1. It tells you what a certificate of documentation is. That's what they use in, in, on the birth certificate. It was signed by a registrar. They call it a certificate of registry. It's actually referred to as registry endorsement. It's signed by the register at the hospital. And I did some research under the registrars, and they're all probate judges in probate courts. And probate is a division of ecclesiastical and admiralty maritime law. And this is going to blow you away. I found a, a, a guy that sells. What they do is they sell your estate. They call it a domain. A domain means a state. Go look it up in uh, in the etymology dictionary. Domain means a state. So what they do is they sell your estate. Your estate is a domain name to ICANN, which is inter. International Corporation of Numbers and Names. Guess who owns all that? An NITA, National Institution for Telecommunications, owned by the Secretary of Commerce. And under the China Trade Act, they sell your estate internationally and globally. They have about 12 corporations that are incorporated in the District of Columbia, and they sell your estate internationally to investors. Capital, it actually says this. I've had, I have a 100-page treatise, which is not on this website, but I can show you this. It says that. It's all documented. Okay, is that it for you, Greg Kazoo? Yep, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, Michigan, you've been unmuted. Well, greetings, greetings, greetings to you. Ah, uh, it was you. Thank you. I was looking. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure if that was you or not, but I'm glad you made it. Okay. So, hi, Truth. <laughs> greetings. Greetings. How you doing, Jean? Oh, I'm doing good. How about you? I'm wonderful, magnificent, marvelous, and splendid. I have a couple of questions for you, and the question was. Uh, someone mentioned um, you were in court when a judge and the prosecution, prosecuting attorney was served a trust in court and were made trustees and both vacated their position and left the courtroom. 
I did that on an appeal, appellate brief. I made an express trust, made all the judges trustees. And then taxed them. I said, you, you're doing it. This is in a mortgage foreclosure case. And they ruled that That's the correct. bank didn't have standing to foreclose on the property. Okay. Did or did second? not? I'm sorry? Did or did not have standing? They did not have standing to foreclose. Thank you. Okay, go and ahead. the second question was, some time ago, when we met back in uh, 2007, you were teaching on how to claim the court case and about the clerk of the court out of the 11th Circuit in Illinois, how they negotiate the uh, GSA bond. Oh, yeah, the SF-24, 25, 25A, 273, 274, and 275. The 275, so the, the 273, 274, and 275 are Miller Reinsurance Agreement. The so 275 is the Miller Reinsurance Agreement in favor of the United States. you got to file all six bonds. The 24 is a bid bond, the 25 is a performance bond, and the 25A is a payment bond. So my question is, what is the process of claiming the court case, the docket? Well, everything is a tax, so they're using your estate so they become a qualified heir under under 10, uh, 1041, I think it is of Title 26. It's either 10, I'm thinking it's 1012 or 1041. Whoever uses, receives money from a decedent who's an infant, minor, uh, becomes a qualified heir. And they have to post a bond under 2032AE11 because they're a qualified heir. So they have to they have to post a bond with the Secretary of Treasury to indemnify them against the tax, the capital transfer tax. That's why everything is a tax because it's a class five gift and estate tax. And I, how I found all this out, I called up Alvin Brown, who's the chief prosecutor for the IRS. And I asked him, I said, is it true that all W-2s, W-4s, 1096s, 1098s, 1099s are all Class 5 gift and estate taxes. He said, how did you know that? I said, well, I read the IDRS manual, the ADP 6209 decoding manual. He says, you're not supposed to be reading that. That's for official use only. I said, that's why I read it. He broke out and started laughing. thought it was funny. But he said I was 100% correct. So I called up and I eventually got around to the Complex Issues Committee in Dayton, Ohio. And it, 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 this, I asked this IRS agent, I said, uh, can you tell, answer questions regarding Class 5 gifts and estate taxes? And see in, in the in the in the UK, they call it an inheritance tax. Here they call it a class five gift and estate tax. That's the, that's the difference between the two. And so they referred me to the to the complex issues committee. So I called them up and I started asking them questions. They said I was 100% correct. Well, I remember you teaching on the 706 and the 709 the gift and estate taxes and the generation skipping taxes in detail. Right. It can, it can either be from a, tr a trust or a non-trust. Uh, 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 it means, uh, I want to be sure I say this right. It could be a, a, a skipping person can be a trust or a non-trust. If you read 2611 and 2612 and 2613. And when they do a taxable termination on your uh, on your ownership of anything, they're the 
the the person that terminates it is liable for the tax. Like when these judges do a taxable termination on your interest in property on a mortgage foreclosure case, they have to file a a tax return and pays the tax on the termination. There's a taxable termination. You have a taxable transfer, taxable dis- distribution, taxable termination, and a taxable sale. If there's a sale or distribution of the estate assets, there's a tax. You know how I found all this out? I have an IRS lien that says that. I said this is. He, it said it was a 1040 tax on an alternate valuation on a carryover basis under 2032A. Well, if you go to 1040, it says it's a tax on farm property. So they're taxing you as farm property. If you go to Title Seven, Section 136, it classifies humans as animals. Well, I learned that uh, several years ago from this gentleman named Gene Keating. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. But, again, he taught quite extensively on the 706 and 709. And also, I was asking you about claiming the court docket. <clears throat> do, do you remember teaching on that? Yeah, I remember. So. Would you go over the steps on how you could claim your court docket? When you say claim it, what are you referring to? The court case, to claim the bonds and to settle and close the the, the matter. Okay, I'll tell you what, uh, uh, If you read, there's a book called The Complete Book of Wills, Estates, and Trusts by Alexander Bove. And Alexander Bove says that before you can have settlement and closure, there has to be an agreement between the trustees and the beneficiaries as to what taxes are owed. That's why everything is is a class, everything is a tax issue. There's, they never pay the capital transfer tax. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In California, you have a preliminary change of title and ownership form that when you, technically, Adam Leventon, who's the head of the uh, uh, School of Law uh, out of Washington, D.C., he says that technically a mortgage is a sale repurchase agreement. So what you're doing is selling the property to the alleged lender, and then you buy it back from him. So when they, they're the buyer and you're the seller, the buyer has to pay the 3% capital, track, uh, capital transfer tax under 480.03 of the California uh, Revenue and Taxation Code, and they never do that. So they therefore never owned the property because they didn't pay the capital transfer tax on the change of title and ownership. Most people have never even heard of that. I met one of the biggest law firms in New York City and they said I was full of you know what. And two weeks later they called me back and said I was 100% correct. In fact, in Florida, they have a a capital transfer tax on the promissory note and the change of title and ownership. So you got to pay a tax on the on the sale, purchase and sale, or sale, sale and purchase of the promissory note, which is really a security. Nobody brings up the fact that it's a security. It's not a it's not a negotiable instrument. It's a security. By rule of statute construction, it can't be both a note and a security. And what de- what determines what it is is its maturity. You have a thirty year maturity that makes it a security. And it's not payable for thirty years. So how can it be in default? If you could 
pay any delinquency in payment at maturity, how can it, how can the loan be in default? Well, when you express the trust on a judge and the prosecutor to settle and close the account, that's well, what I'm you, that's what I'm what do, what do you, about. Okay, what do you mean by expressing the trust? That's the word you just used, Jim. You said you serve and express the trust on a foreclosure case that you were involved in. I told I told I told the judges it was a written trust but it's called an express trust. And I pointed the judges as fiduciary trustees who, did, who were then responsible for all the taxes. I made them liable for all the taxes. They're liable for more than that. They're, if they're the trustee, aren't they supposed to be managing the trust itself? Yes. They're supposed to be paying the taxes. So I made them liable by a trust for the payment of all the taxes. And if you read Bove's book on the complete book of wills, estates, and trusts, unless there's an agreement between the trustee and the beneficiaries as to what taxes are owed, uh, you can't have settlement and closure. That's how you get. That's why everything is a tax issue. You can't have redemption because what you're talking about so when you say settlement and closure, you're talking about redemption, zeroing of the account. You can't take the payables and the receivables and balance the books until the taxes are paid. That's why they call it a tax return. When, when the interest circulates as principal, when it's sitting there, it's called principal. And that's why they call it income, because it's coming in. And what does it come into? It comes back to venue by revenue. So it goes back to the principal, and then they settle and close the account by crediting the payables to the receivables, as there was out the receivables. Now you have balanced books, so there's no money owed. That's why everything is bookkeeping. That's why everything is a tax, because you don't have any money. Nobody's getting paid. Thank you so much for taking my questions. You're welcome. Thanks, Truth. Okay, next up. Oh, let me see here. Who's up? North Georgia. You've been unmuted. Go ahead, North Georgia. Hey, how are you guys doing? Ms. Keenan. Fine. Thank you. Good, Good evening now, to you, too. I want, I want Mr. Keaton um, to to explain that deceiving the estate again. How um, How is the, 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 the name actually a, a decedent? Because it's a minor. Okay. And if you look up the, if you go into the etymology dictionary and look up the word deceit, it comes from two words: deceit, d, d e, and then seed. Then they put dent on it. When okay. you seed something, you depart or withdraw from it. If you go look up in the etymology dictionary, what deceit means, it means to depart from or withdraw from. So what you've done okay. is you've never claimed the estate. So what I did is a right. DBA. If you go into the California <laughs> Professions and Business Code under under 170.03 and 170.703.18, it says you can't go into court and enforce any contract or transaction unless you own the DBA, the fictitious business. Right. Mr. Keaton, isn't um, is the name also covered under like uh, trade name laws? Also, since trade names yeah. don't really have to be registered. Yeah, you could claim it as a trade name, couldn't you? Yeah, service mark or trade name under the USPTO. Absolutely. And, yeah. and it seems just uh, like I um, like a lot of the old case law I've read, like from the late 1800s and the early 1900s. It, it seems like um, what the what like the state especially is doing is like um taking your name and putting making you a trustee actually and and making you um uh, right uh, commissioning you in a public office and when you when you aren't doing whatever by the statutes because in Alabama it says that our statutes operate for the benefit of the state 
So that's an offense right there from from my definition. So it seems like what they're doing is the, the trust property that, that belongs to the name, they're saying that you're not doing what you're supposed to do for the benefit of the state. So, therefore, they, they come and bring these claims against you, charge charge you with these duties, and when you don't discharge the duties, they they make you surrender whatever property, the attachment. Well, I ask of it, have you got a claim against my state? Okay. And, and yep. then they answer yes or no, and then I say, well, did you put up a bond to indemnify the tax? Right. So somebody got to pay the tax. Right, right, right. Right. If you read 6324, subsection E of Title 26, uh, a lien attaches as soon as they, that's why it says in E11 of 2032A, E11, it says they have mm-hmm. to post a bond with the secretary to identify them as against tax liability. Right, because right, right. It's a capital transfer tax. They don't call it an inheritance tax. They call it a capital transfer tax. So what they're right. doing is acting as a qualified heir because they were the recipient of funds from a dead person from a minor's estate. So that makes them a qualified right. heir. Well, so they right. haven't paid the tax. They haven't paid the tax. Right. That's why everything is a tax issue, because there is no money. Right. You wouldn't have a capital you can... tax if there was real money. Right. Because it's coming from an and... estate, not from not from money. Right, right. That's why and Alexander, and you can... Bowe, Alexander Bove, let me tell you what happened. Mm-hmm. I, I called up Alexander Bove. I called okay. him up and I asked him. I says, uh, and he says, "Where where do you live?" And I said, "Ohio." And he says, uh, "I know the top gift and estate tax attorney in the United States, Phil Lilly." So he gave me his number and his name, and I called him up and I made an appointment. And I went down there with somebody else and went up to the twelfth floor. And this is in Columbus. The office is a twelve story building. Looks like the pause. Okay. So I sat down with this guy, and I started questioning him. And I talked for three and a half hours. You know what he said to me after three and a half hours? What was that? You're scaring the shit out of me. <laughs> I thought he knew yeah. everything. I thought he knew what was going on. He told me he was telling me I knew more than he did. Right. Right. You know, everybody, I t- I'm not telling you this to brag about. I went and took a reading comprehension test. There's a company that tests people for reading comprehension. So yes, I took sir. the test, and I, I turned the test in, and they called me into the office after everybody turned all their papers in. And they, they, they've been doing this for 50 years. They test They test millions of people in 50 years. They called me in and they looked at my, they showed me my test score and he said, I got a 12. And I said, well, I said, so what? I said, what does that mean? I didn't know. I didn't know what the hell that meant. Right. And we, we've been testing adult males over 50 for 50 years and, and nobody has ever got a 12. I said, well, what did, what score did he get? And he said, about a five or six. And I said, what is that? And he said, a grammar school reading comprehension. These are adult mm. males, 50 years or older. It's yeah. not a, a grammar school reading comprehension. Well, when he told me that, I knew what the problem was. People can't read. You got two classes of people, people that don't read and people that can't read. That's true. I agree. And you can read something, and it doesn't do any good to read it if you don't comprehend what's being said. Absolutely. I, to, I interviewed 12 lawyers and flunked them all. They couldn't tell me what, what 15 U.S.C. 78 C.A. 10 meant. That's a definition for the mm. mm-hmm. well, My wife also wanted to ask you a question. I'm going to let her grab the phone, okay? One second. Go ahead. Um, it's going to be quick. Hi, Mr. Keaton. Um, I have um, I filed bonds in all six of the cases that I'm in. And when I did it back in t- 2015, I didn't quite understand 
everything that I need to do, so my process is incomplete. Um, but I have okay, since what, discovered what that of, I need. What kind of a bond did you file, and why did you file a bond? Um, I filed um the 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 SF the release of lien from escrow, the ninety ninety one. Yeah, the ninety and ninety one. Yes, sir. I did that one because I understood that whenever they take the body or whatever other property, it's just being held in escrow by, like, the yeah, sheriff yeah, or whoever. When you're in prison, you're in escrow. Right, you're in escrow. Warehouse. So that's why. I, you're, yes, you're, sir. you're a commodity in, 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 in a warehouse. A right. prison is nothing so but a warehouse. Those, right. So I filed those two, and then I put in the, the bonds at the state level. You know, what are the... um. What are the GS bonds for the state level? I forgot. Um, I think it's 274 and 5 and all of those. So I was trying to discharge the case, but I realized that I didn't put, I think I think I need to do an international bill of exchange for each case because I, now that I'm reading the tax codes, I'm understanding that that's like an acquisition, if I'm, if I'm correct. They have and, what they call um, a contracting officer that handles all those bonds. You shouldn't have given it Sir? to the person. You should have given it to the contractor. Who's the contractor? He's the one that, under the Department of DOD, that runs all the bonds. You have to tender the bond to him. Who Who would that be? Well, you have to look it up. You have to go into the Department of DOD. Uh, it's been a while since I've looked at this stuff. Uh, let's see. Oh. Uh, there's a department under the DOD called, uh, I'm thinking of CDIL. I'm trying to remember, it's been about 10 years since I've been into this stuff. Oh, okay. He's the, are you, oh, you're saying he's the person that handles those bonds, and I should have sent them to him instead of filing them in the case. Right. He's the head of the uh, the contractors. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up here. Okay. So I'll give you the right information. I don't want to give you the wrong information. Okay. Because I know the bonds do say something about um, whoever signing is the contract officer for the United States. Yeah, and I figured that could be. all purchases, too. Right, right. So I'm just trying to correct my process because um, now I'm getting ready to assess the tax on everything. Because now I understand I'm not dealing with anything but just a tax issue. So and you got to be the office. You got to be the registered owner. You got to have a certificate of documentation, which is the registration. Did you know that under under forty six twelve one hundred one? Um, yes, sir. I think um, I didn't read it in the IRS code. But I do understand, like, in principle with reading the Securities Exchange Act that says that you have to register stuff. So I don't have any claims on any of the bonds that I put in. So I'm just trying to correct all this because I don't – I'm realizing I made mistakes. So I do realize I need to do a UCC-1 on them. But since I've already filed them in there, there's no telling where they are. So. Is the con contingency, contingency contracting officers is what they call them. Okay. So do I just reissue them, just do a whole nother set over, and don't worry about the ones I've already given, or what do I do about that? You, you need to tender to, to him, the contracting officer. You need to find out who it is. They're assigned uh, under the DOD. Okay. Okay. And then, um, do you know much about the um, how to do a prompt assessment with the Secretary of the Treasury? Because I'm kind of on that level. Like, I don't want to. I just want to deal with him with getting a release of lien and everything too. Because I know from reading the IRS code, he can do all that. He's very powerful. So. Yeah, you gotta you gotta uh, uh, balance the books. Yeah. You gotta so pay a, go about a payment order. You got to okay. charge the account of the person you're trying to get the uh, because it's a tax issue. They haven't paid the tax. Right. right. 
Well, you know how they say you're not supposed to lean the state. So what if you're dealing with the instrumentality of the state? Can you charge the? Because they're the one that sent us the bill. It has like a agency name on it. They're the ones that sent you what? There's a overdue child support payment that um, they're saying we all of all of a sudden all of a sudden owe because they offset it <laughs> through the treasury. You have to offset it. They can't do right. it. All. The, the, only the tre- secretary of the treasury, uh, with authorization from you, can do a set off. They do yeah, the they money. Said, they... That's why everything is a tax issue. It's not a money issue. It's a tax issue. All these right. courts are acting as tax courts. So, um, being that the agency, the county agency, sent me the bill, can I just tax the amount or the face value of the bill against them when I do the ledger? Yeah, then send the send the payment order to the secretary of the treasury for for the accrediting. Right. Yeah, because that's how they got their um, offset. So I was just going to do the same thing so as not to like abandon the claim or not have a counterclaim going. So. You, need, you need to download the Defense Contingency Contracting Handbook. It's called the DCCH. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, I'll do that, Mr. Keaton. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, hold on a second. Uh <laughs> Hold on a second. I got this. Uh, I opened up this magnifier thing, and uh, I have to adjust it. Uh, there. Okay. All right. Next up is. Wait a minute. Let's see here. Talk to you nine o one. Go ahead. You've been unmuted. Yes, I have a question about the classes. What's the color of classes? That you teach. What is what is the what? The total classes. Well, I cover everything from taxes to admiralty, merit. Most everything, everything is admiralty. No, I asked how many classes. You you mentioned the price. How many classes do you take? Five, four, how many? In all. Well, I teach one class at a time, and usually it's a three or four hour class. If I'm attending what subject I cover, like I either okay. cover tax, what makes you liable for taxes, how to get rid of a tax lien, how to get rid of uh, uh, how to do, you got to understand, there's th- three classes of laws that you have to understand. You have to understand uh, trust law, tax law, commercial law, and accounting. I haven't met anybody in 50 years that understands all four of them. In fact, I haven't met anybody that understands the Uniform Commercial Code. I can show you a dozen cases that say that the Uniform Commercial Code is indicative of the federal common law of admiralty. It's all admiralty maritime law. You know who wrote Article 9? Nobody reads Article 9 or Article 8. Did you know that if you sell collateral, you're a debtor, not a seller? You're a debtor, not a creditor? Only the buyer is the creditor with a security interest. And under 9-203G, you have no enforceability of a lien under a mortgage. Under uh, article, This is coming from Adam Leventon, not from me. Okay, so my question is, in your case that you had, you said the lower court did something, you appealed it. What did the lower court rule on? Uh, what, what, which one are you referring to? You, refer, you referred on this call to an appellate court that threw it out or ruled in your favor. Well, this was appealed from the Court of Common Pleas in Ohio. And I, I appealed it up to the appellate court. So what did the lower court decide in that case? Well, they what we did is we we tendered a bond, 
and uh, in the lower court, we tendered a bond, and they wouldn't accept the bond, indemnity bond. And we tendered it to the judge, and he accepted the uh, the tender of payment, but they didn't stop. It didn't stop the foreclosure. So we appealed it up to the appellate court, and they threw the case out. Okay, well, what do you mean by they threw it out? Did they uphold the lower court's decision, or did they reverse no, they, the whole? they ruled that the that the and this is bank bank uh, N A number one which is owned by J.P. Morgan Chase, they ruled that they didn't have standing to foreclose. So, in other words, <clears throat> the appellate court reversed the lower court's decision. Right. So when you went back to the lower court, what was the final outcome? Well, they they, they threw it out. We, it didn't go back to the original court. The, the appellate court ruled that they didn't have standing to foreclose, the, to foreclose on the property. Well, normally yeah. appellate courts, when they rule, they have ruled on what the lower court did. And if they disagree with that decision, it goes back for further litigation. I didn't handle a case after that. <laughs> okay. Last question. <clears throat> That's confused me to what, what you just said about that case. But the last question I had was about your classes. You're saying that you keep mentioning California law. Do your classes deal with... Um, anything outside of California? Other yeah, states? any state. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next up is um, A. Ali Moham Alim Muhammad. I'm going to get it right one of these days. <laughs> Hello, Angela. How you doing, Mr. Hi. Keegan? Okay. How are you? Evening, Mr. King. I'm doing pretty good. Good, uh, good. Gene King, how are you doing? All right. I hear you very good. Um, well, I'm, I, I just want to uh, ask, ask you something. I'd like to ask you something about UCC. <clears throat> but you see, in regard to that particular uh, uh, note, which is UCC 3, 305C, I, I, I heard you speak about it. Uh, the UCC, huh? That's pretty cool, but right, right, that's right. And um, uh, which is a I just want to recoupment, it's means a counter. Counter. yes, sir. Recoupment, that's, that's where we at. And yeah. you know, because you know, recoupment comes in two parts it comes in a permissive and mandatory. If you read rule okay. 13, it's mandatory to file if you have a if your transaction arises from the same transaction and occurrence as the plaintiff's claim, it's a mandatory counterclaim. If you don't bring a mandatory counterclaim, you waive it. Okay, it's mandatory. Okay, but, 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 it's, but it's just under the guidelines of UCC 3-305C. Does that fall in that guidelines of that, of that particular uh, yes. uh, 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 code? Yes. Okay. Because I didn't know that because I just actually wanted to get your opinion on on filing that particular uh, under that particular particular code to uh to see what your what your opinion was regarding it because in, in federal court I tell you I had judges tell me some things I'm like listening to him he talking about uh, uh, cases he he he, he, he quoted some about he called himself schooling me about foreclosure and I'm saying God, it's like I've been in this t almost ten years now dealing with this, this situation with different people and the, and the acts and the laws itself. And I don't, I still trying to figure it out. Not that I don't know, because it depends on the understanding and your lack and, your, and, your, and how, how great, well, not great, but how, 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 how high your understanding is and, and your level of understanding for you to even understand any of it. So I want to compliment you on what you understand. It's not a fact that you know about all these laws and all these things that you're citing here. The point is, in my opinion, is that you have a broad understanding Unlike a lot of other human beings, and I, I and I see where you're coming from because I can see it. I can see that unlike all the rest of us, a lot of us, and not not, not that I'm not of the same uh, uh, understanding of you, but it's definitely different. And you have a a, a, a knack for reading such as I, such as myself. And but the the most important thing is is that you understand so well this particular form of law, 
And I, I hear what you're saying, and it's, I know it's blowing a lot of people's minds. Not me, but it's blowing a lot of people's minds. That's why I'm asking you <clears throat> your opinion. Yeah, you know, everything, everything is a, it's an investment contract. Everything. You know what I mean by everything? You can't show me no, anything right. that's not an investment contract, and it's not a security. A security is everything that you use as a security. Did you know your banks take your your checks and they sell them to investors? I'm I, I understanding that. They, cancel, I, I, I they cancel the check, they sell it to an investor. I understand. I, I I've read that before. I wouldn't. I haven't did any research on it, but I can believe you because I've heard it. Just like all the things you told in the past I, I, that you informed of, informed us of in the past. I went back and did my due diligence. I, I do research on it. Everything you said tonight, if I can, I'm going to do research on it. And I haven't heard you in a while. And I'm just glad they haven't did anything to you that they don't do the rest of them because you seem to be caught up with them. And usually when you catch up with them and they come about and run into another hole, they try to shoot out that hole something much that you can't see it. Then they try to put you away like you did so many others in the past. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't think Article 3 has any application to anything because you're dealing with securities. And securities are financial assets with security entitlement, security holder, and <coughs> if you have security entitlement, you're a security holder. Mm -hmm. And so you have a, you, that's what you need to deal with is Article 8, and nobody uses eight, uh, Article 8. Mm -hmm. You said you said it's best to use Article 8, which is, which, which is, which is, which is under the Uniform Commercial Code, right? <laughs> Article right. eight, right? Everything is governed by Article eight because everything is a security. Everything you put your signature, that's because of the bankruptcy of thirty three. Everything I'm just you put your that. signature to on it is money. And I was just going to say that because because I was just going to say, aren't we still dealing? Aren't we still on the, that particular bankruptcy of nineteen thirty three? I don't think we never came from up on it, have we? No, they never. It's never been repealed. There is no money. Right. right. No, I, I, and I know that. I, I, I understand. And we, see, because I've been in front of enough for the federal judges, and I respect them. I, I go in just like they, you know, they're there to be respected. They're, they're first and foremost, human beings. But the judge part, I try to deal with it with the law and, uh, uh, and, and, stay, and stay in accord with the law. But here's the thing. If we're, we're still dealing with under, under the Bankruptcy Act, then this UCC 305C, which is which is recoupment should apply in court when you're trying to get your promissory note. Am I correct or am I wrong? Yeah, you have a recoupment, but you have to file the claim. And what is the claim? Tax claim. You have to file a tax claim. Yeah, the 1099 OID, huh? And you and you got you got to raise three dash three oh six. It says you have a possessionary right in the instrument and or the proceeds. Under 3 306. Uh huh. So that's 3 306. You have, you have to raise what again? I'm sorry. Say it again. I meant to click. Uh, say that uh, uh, again. You say you have to raise 306 as a resort. And that's, uh, that, that is another. Uh, that's what after 305. Yeah, 3 306. You have a possessionary and property right in the instrument and or its proceeds. But you never claim it. And I'll tell you another thing. Here, here's what, what people don't understand. is 4-102. Go read 4-102. And hang on a minute. I'll pull it up and read it to you and show you what I'm talking about. And nobody reads this. It, it deals with transfers and bank deposits because you're always dealing with a bank under Article Four. So this this that's why it's called applicability, and nobody ever reads this. And this tells you Article Eight controls three and four. If it's an item includable in in four. And it's governed by three and eight. Eight controls three. If there's a conflict, eight controls three and four. Mm -hmm. You 
Here, I'll read it to you, and you'll see what I'm talking about. This is very important. Mm-hmm. To the extent that items and what what if you look up the definition of items in 1-103, or excuse me, 3-103, it tells you it taught, it's into instruments. Uh, 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 items means instrument. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we we define our terms here. To the extent that instruments within this article are also within Articles 3 and 8, they are subject to those articles. But if there is conflict, the article governs Article 3, but Article 8 governs this article. So they're within 3 and 8, and they are subject to those articles. But if there's a conflict, and there's, there definitely is a contract, 8 controls. Mm -hmm. Why does eight control mm -hmm. three? Because it's a, it's securities. Article eight is investment grade securities. Everything. If you go look and go into the insurance code and look up the definition of a security, <laughs> everything is a security. Because you use debt in the public domain, they use debt for money. So what they're doing is selling debt as securities to investors. There's the whole thing in a nutshell. I can okay, prove let, nothing, nothing. None of that is hypothetical or conjectural. It's, it's concrete and eminent. Okay, but I know you, you said earlier that that note at, at, at one point it does not become that that note anymore. It's that is a security now, which we know because. From sometime from inception, from the day one, they turned it into a security. I've, I've, I've uncovered that. Sometimes they've on that no, same I, day. I, I think it was a security from the inception. I don't think it ever huh? ever was a note. You think so? Yeah. Be, because of what? Because of that thirty year extension. That yeah, 30, because that 30 of year security. Extension? Yeah, I, I, I have I have no reason to to disagree with you. Because what you had spoken about earlier. Go read, 15, go read 15 U.S.C. 78 C.A. 10. It tells you that it's, it's C. A. 10? All, Yeah, 78 C. 10. It covers everything. Hmm. It's, okay. it's C with a small A parentheses A and then uh, C. A. 10. I think I may have read, I may have read that. Um, I may have read that. But 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 again, Dean, we 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 should not let them get past the fact that we we are approaching recoupment when we're trying to recoup the note, which is ours from the beginning. The signature is going to follow us. Am I correct? Right. And and that's what I'm pointing. At. That's what I'm aiming at. That. Like for instance, this, let me say for for instance, for the sake of knowledge, UCC three dash two o three b deals with assignment. If the assignment was tampered with, if the assignment was done through illegality, then guess what? The assignment, according to this law, according to this rule of the UCC, the assignment does not pass. Again, on the UCC 3-203B, if, that, if that's a fact, then again, we're still not dealing with a security instrument, instrument but correct me if I'm wrong, we're still starting with the assignment, which was meant to turn into a security instrument. Because if we go to the Fannie Mae uh, 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 regulations and, and rules, we'll find that they have to also make a second assignment, which most people don't know. They have to make a second assignment in addition to that assignment they made, although they might have been posted the assignment in the register, they have to still make an assignment to Fannie Mae to let them know who is the investor, by the way. They have to let Fannie Mae know that those assignments exist and if they mess that up, it says they must. They shall do it. Now we have a problem now. That's why I'm saying this, this, this 305C is so important because, because if that's turned into a security, what about the assignment, this 3203B? You, 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 you follow me? 
203B, a transfer of an instrument, whether or not the transfer is a negotiation vested in the transferee, any right of the transferor to enforce the instrument. Including right. any right as a holder in due course. But they're not but a holder in due course because they took it subject to your uh, claims and defenses. As right. In, in a, go ahead, I'm sorry. Say it again. They're not a holder in due course. Cannot okay. acquire rights of a holder in due course by a transfer directly. Or indirectly. Indirectly. And, it, and here's the, it here's says the thing. They can't, it, it, uh, uh, if the transfer engaged in fraud or illegality, and it's all fraud. Mm -hmm. Because they, you know what they did? You know, the instrument is a uh, forgery. Because mm -hmm. they obtained the signature of every people versus Martinez. Who? People versus Martinez. So you, it's a California okay. Supreme Court decision. It says if any of signature is obtained on a negotiable instrument by misrepresentation, it's a forgery. Okay, I think I read that before. I think I read it recently, that case. I think I had it in my log somewhere. But, but the point I'm making is, for people, for the sake of knowledge and the people that's on the call, don't look up, forget about the note right now, because this assignment is being transferred, and I'm not leaving out Fannie Mae. I'm not leaving out uh, the rest of them, Annie Mae and all the rest of them. Just those people who are secure, who run the security. You, you know why they sell all, almost all the notes were sold to Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, Jenny Mae, and Sally Mae? Which uh -huh. is HUD. You know why they sell them all to HUD? So they can make money as far as I'm concerned. No, they not money, they, but so they, they, they can invest they're, it. They're the human capital fund. That's they right. They manage That's the right. human capital fund. That's right. <clears throat> and and they conspire with the federal government, believe it or not. Uh, I don't want to say that. Let me let, let, let me let, let, let me let, let me go that far because I don't have it. I don't have it right in front of me. Without without knowing what's in writing, I'm gonna leave it alone. I'm gonna let you continue the show. But I appreciate it, man, because, uh, 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 Gene, there's things you said in the past that still applies today. That's over 10 years ago. I heard you say something more close to 10 years ago that still yeah. applies today. Right. Uh, and, and now you're talking about these instruments as though we, we always, who knows how long we've been under, under Uniform Commercial Code, how long we've been living by this, how this law been, this has been a long time. So they, not, they haven't gave it up. But they, say they know it still exists. But I'll tell you and the people on this call, I've been in front of enough uh, in front of enough federal judges, in my opinion, and they will tell you something that they think they know, and this, you accept it and look at them, and you already know you are not even telling the truth. If the judge is not telling the truth, you'll know it because you done already studied it and you'll be aware of it. And the judge thinks you don't know, that's when I just shut my mouth. I said, okay, keep on. Because I'm going to back you in the corner, and then I'm going to see how you back this up. Because it's only recording. Most, most federal courts I've been in, I get a recording. I had to take it to the state court. I had to take my own court reporter. But it exists, the recording, and it's trying to use common law. But I, I thank you. I just want to, I'm going to back off and let somebody else say something, because I, I can talk about this all night, and I hear what you're saying. And uh, thank you for imparting your knowledge. And I just want to uh, to end this by, by saying that. Okay. Thank that you. Note, that, that note. That note. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. Thank, thank you, Angela. You know, good night. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, next up is uh, guest 146. You've been unmuted. There's still. Yes, can y'all hear me? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hey, good evening to everyone. Good evening to good you, evening. Uh, to the host and everyone that's listening. Jane, I just want to share something with you. I've been listening to your conversation, and um. I've come to learn that this is all about the law of agency and partnership, signifying obligation, surety, and obligee. See, everyone has been issued a registrar, full faith and credit certificate by without a contract. Therefore, everyone is acting voluntarily as a general partner. Now, well, it comes to the law of surgeyship, which, which is contribution. Well, surety, <clears throat> yeah. surety, hold on, let me finish. Let me just say what I'm about to say. A surety is one who makes sure the obligation, which is the principal, 
performs in a contract, all right? An obligee is a county of somebody who forces you to have a bond to do business. As I just stated, this is all about the law of agency and partnership, and everyone has been issued a full faith and credit bond through a registrar. So everyone must comprehend to prove that they are agent to a state, which is really the United States of America. All right, now, as I say, a surety is one who forces the performance of the principal, which is the obligation. So once you create a contract, because as I just said, you're doing this voluntarily. Once you create a contract, that forces the other party to have to perform. All right? This is what this is all about, the law of agency and partnership. And I know because I'm a living witness to it. No, not living, but yes, I am a witness to it. I've accomplished what most are trying to accomplish because they don't comprehend the law of agency and partnership. Everyone voluntarily is considered a general partner. Therefore, a general partner pays all the bills. You must put a limit to your partnership. That's why they got LPs, LC, uh, LLC, and so on and so forth. All right, but the key to understanding this is that a surety is the one who forces the performance of the principal, which is their obligation. Every state of, state of Florida, state of Delaware, state of New York, doesn't matter. It's nothing but an agency to the United States. It's a United States state of. Well, they w- I guarantee you, once you create a contract, they will perform, and what everybody's going through will go away because there is no lawful money, and all you have to do is go to 31 U.S.C. Uh, 5115, which tells you uh, to order United States notes, which is the lawful money, all right? So I just wanted to share that because I'm listening to all these calls, and no one really is speaking on what's really going on and what's the issue. Because of our voluntarily ignorance to a municipal corporation, they have no stand. You, we have no standings to force them to perform. I promise everyone who's listening on this call: if you create a contract, which is a mutual agreement, which is protected under the Constitution, your problems will go away. You have to comprehend: you are an agent and express your partnership in the agency. That's all this is. You have to go through all this other stuff. None of that stuff, what I've come to learn, really matter. Once you put a contract in and force them to perform. Now, you can say whatever you're going to say, and I'll go from there. Okay, Gene. I would expound on what on what he said. I agree with what he's saying uh, to the extent that uh, FICA is the Federal Insurance Contributions Act, and I'm going to quote the scripture. There shall uh, Matthew 24:21 says that there shall be tribulation such as the world has not seen nor shall ever see. Uh, I have a a treatise. It's 55 Tulane Law Review. And it goes into contribution and indemnification. And contribution is an extreme form of indemnification, and indemnification is an extreme form of contribution. And every state in the union has adopted the Contribution Among Tortfeasors Act. Right. It's all Admiralty Maritime Law. Right. And, and right. the well, rule that they apply in every situation is the primary active versus secondary liability. If you have the primary active degree of fault, you cannot collect from the secondary. And let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me finish. All of this has come from general averaging contribution, which comes from Admiralty Maritime Law on the sea. And where Admiralty, where general averaging contribution comes from, is it comes from uh, when they have a peril on the sea, 
and they do a, a jetsam, ligon, balsam, which is throwing cargo overboard to save the ship. Every passenger on the ship has to pay for the loss of the cargo. That's where general average, that's where the concepts of general averaging contribution come. Which is what they're applying under contribution, but the the loss, the rule they apply, if you have the primary degree of fault that contributes to the loss, now how do they contribute to the loss? By removing gold and silver as lawful money, money under 12 U.S.C. 152, which says the lawful money of the United States shall be construed to be gold and silver coin. It tells you in section 12 U.S.C. 411 and 412 that uh, Federal Reserve notes, which were lawful money prior to 33, could be re were redeemable at any Treasury Department office or any Federal Reserve bank for lawful money. Exactly. You don't have any redeemability and you have no money. That's the primary active degree of fault, so they can't, co so, so they can't collect contribution from you. Now, let me expound on that. The word contribution comes from tribulation. If you read Matthew 24, 21, it tells you that there shall be tribulation such as the world's never seen nor shall ever see. Contribution is an extreme form of indemnification, which is surety ship. And when, you, when you're acting as a surety for somebody, you have subrogation. You subrogate yourself to the principal by contract. If you assume his liability, you have the same rights as he does by subrogation. Well, well, like I just said, um, I want to add something to this. Everyone is an attorney in fact, which they have to provoke their private law or civil law. Now, all attorneys are at law, which is common law. And another word for common is ignorance, vulgar, general all right. No one wants to be under the common law. That's another thing that everybody has wrong. You're already under the common law. At law, attorney is a common law attorney. No one has invoked their private or civil rights because the file number on the certificate of birth is your attorney, in fact, ID number. That's why you can give someone else power of attorney because you're considered an attorney in fact so as i just stated if you understand what i just said and you force a mutual contract no longer voluntarily from ignorance you will force your municipal corporation to perform therefore you will be held harmless all right because this is what this is all about now a bond at a treasury or your county treasury or your state treasury will hold you harmless. Everyone can go to the attorney in general website right now of their idle state, and I mean not idle. The problem is we are all idle worshippers and we don't know it. But everyone can go to their idle state attorney general website and look under the divisions of security. And comprehend if you let your attorney general know with a mutual contract, forcing a hand, you're the one who's really a broker dealer to all instruments. As I like to teach my fellow man, this is nothing but bills of exchange between intermediaries of notes to pay trade creditors because there is no lawful money. They right. came up with the SEC 1933, and then they came up with the 34 to create this fake thing called insurance with an I. But it's all about insurance with an E. Now, the insurance with the E is the bond for which is two parties, all right? Two parties, where the third one is an intermediary who's usurping you. So if you understand insure with an E and not with an I, You'll get what I'm saying. But as I stated, this is all about bonding, which is insurance, which will give assurance with an A. Now, all municipal corporations are nothing but underwriters because they're insurance companies, sort of you know, speaking. You know where the concept of underwriter came from? British shipping laws. 
Right, because we're all vessels. Our body is a vessel. Our body is the land. Our body is the ark of the covenant that God promised us. This is another thing. It comes down to comprehending the true terms of words. And this is why I'm speaking to everybody as a man, female, and male, and not people which are a mass of illiterate persons, not humans, as you just stated, which are monsters and slaves. An individual is me, you, and everybody here acting like the individual entity called the United States for which we all have the right to act in that person. This is why when you create a contract, you bond the county. Now you're doing business as the county because the counties are separate than the states. They're not protected by the 11th Amendment of the Constitution because they're not the state. They are a private, public corporation yeah, substituting they, local government or federal government in your area. They yeah, are their own true. separate states, if everybody understands that. All right, yeah, they, I just wanted to share that. And I usually don't do these calls things, but a friend of mine asked me to listen to y'all, and I'm listening to everything, and I'm not hearing the meat of the cause of all this problem. But the cause is law of agency and our ignorance not to put a contract in to bond the performance of a municipal corporation or any other entity. Now you have standings to create promissory notes off the bond that you issued. Right. That's all I have to say. Y'all have a good evening. I'm going to fall back and listen. Oh, well, thank you so much for calling in and contributing. I appreciate it. Um, let's move on to Central Georgia. You've been unmuted. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, how's everybody doing tonight? Fine, thank you. Okay. You questions? I have food. Do I got questions? I want to try to make them as simple as possible. Okay. okay. I have um, actually three issues that I'm dealing with, um, and I'm wondering if uh, they can all be centered around um, the SF-2425-9091. Uh, all right. So I have a court case where I was charged with six felonies for uh, – I signed a, a 456 in the wrong place, and they got me for identity theft and forgery. Didn't sign the judge's name or the DA's name. I signed my name. So the first question is could uh, the 24 – this is in state court. Could the 2425 um, – Resolve that issue. Did you, uh, was there an indictment? I, I, I got arrested uh, three years ago, and I haven't heard hair or nothing. I haven't been arraigned, nothing. And why, why haven't you been arraigned? Because <laughs> they got no case. Well, they probably didn't have an indictment. Were you taken before a grand jury? I haven't been nowhere, Gene. They arrest. I was. And here's the sad part. I was already in jail. Okay. Is okay. this a state case or federal? It's state. They tried to send it to the federal. Um, feds wouldn't take it. Uh, why did? Why do you think they didn't take it to? Uh, why they didn't prosecute you? Because basically there has been no crime. Because technically. Um, what they were trying to get me for was for forgery, okay, and identity theft. Well, the forgery, they couldn't get me for forgery because I didn't sign the judge's name or the DA's name. I put my name. Um, the identity theft that, according to the state here, you have to access their financial, inter uh, their financial information. All I did was make them trust, uh, attempt to make them trustee through a form 56. Well, they can't bring a charge because they're bankrupt. What they're okay. doing is, pro is prosecute. What they're doing is bringing a claim against the estate. Right. If you ask them if they have a claim against you, and if they post a, a bond for, to identify them against the, the tax, they'll f refuse to answer it. Tell them to declare the issue by reading the the complaint or the indictment. They can't do it because they don't okay. have it. Okay. 
All right. So the other issues revolve around real estate. Um, county put liens on the property, and one of them, they, I just actually found out today that they illegally uh, converted our, our property from our name into their name. So how, what did would be, put, how did he put a lien on it? Um, basically for property taxes, but we're ministry. We're tax exempt. <laughs> you got a 501c3? Uh, do not. We're 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 nine nine uh, nine five hundred one c three. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, what else? Yeah, that's not a problem. So how would the uh, how would we go into dealing with that? If if, if they're they're coming after you for what? Property taxes. Do you have a statement from them? Do I have a who? A statement. Statement from of accounting. I don't, and they have, um, we have tried to get information from them. Um, they have not given us any information. In fact, um, we did, did, they did send a, you a bill for the tax. They did. Well, send it to the Treasury for payment. How? Who? By endorsing it for payment. Okay. Okay. So get it. Okay. So get it. What you call it? All right. So the third one is the uh, fact of foreclosure. They do, they're not doing a, a foreclosure. They're doing a forfeiture. Well, no. This is properties pay the capital transfer tax on the on on the security. Right, but no, this is a separate issue. This is this is another another property which was foreclosed on in another state. Well, they didn't foreclose on it; they forfeited the property. Okay, so how would I go about would I go about getting that resolved? Well, Making a claim on the security or recouping? Well, you should do a, a payment to the to the Secretary of Treasury and get the money. They'll have to give you a refund. <clears throat> you never claimed the funds. Do what? Ten ninety nine A. I wouldn't do a ten ninety nine. I think that's the, you have a unified tax credit of five million four hundred ninety thousand on the estate side. Have you made over five million four hundred ninety thousand? No. Well, then you don't have any taxable income. Okay. So you're saying uh, send it to to Treasury and collect from there, or pay pay it through Treasury? Yeah, do a 1040V on a pay- payment order on the statement. Endorse it for payment to the Secretary of Treasury. <clears throat> I I tell you how to do all this in my classes. I go into it. I have a program where I type up the, I take the coupon and then I type a pay a money order. I'm, I turn it into a money order. Okay. And I pay the treasury with it and they accept it. <laughs> well, that, that sounds like a winner because I got, I got two, two properties that they foreclosed on. Um, and if we could get any of that back, that would be great. If you, they're, they're not liable, but liable for the tax because you zeroed out the receivables. So now they've got the property without paying the taxes. So now they owe taxes. Now okay. Like the IRS on them. Gotcha. Yeah, because the IRS they, is, not, is not your enemy. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody yeah. Can't bad mouth them, but they, that's because they don't do it right. Right. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, all right. So um, now you were saying something about you did classes or something? On uh, Tuesday night, 6, 6, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. All right. Got to contact Bri- Brian Waite. Send him, uh, you got to make a PayPal payment. Then send him 
And use your correct name. We got people that send pseudonyms, the names of companies, and we we have no idea who the person is. Just right, like right. Brian's email. Huh? Just like Brian's email. Well, yeah, but when you send the, if you give me your, I don't care about the email. I need the correct name. Yeah. Like they use well. they use pseudonyms instead of giving us the correct name, so I have no idea who the person is. So I can't credit the payment until they, you know, they they give me their correct name. But they don't get the link, and then they get mad because they didn't get the link. So. <clears throat> but people need to learn that they need, and sometimes we'll get two or three emails. We'll send out the handouts to the third email, and they said, well, we, I never got any of the handouts. I said, well, did you look at the at the third email you sent us? No. So they look at it, and there's the handout. We get a lot of problems with that because people don't give the – they give you three different. They give you three emails. I hate that. I know I have that problem with people too. Then I got to look through all the different emails to find which one they're talking about that they sent me. <laughs> anyway, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, is that it for you? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, See who's up next is Charles, 8854. Hi, Charles. Hi, Angela. Hi, Jean. It's great to be contacting you both again here. Nice to hear your voice. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Jean, Charles Stewart from Oregon here. We've been in phone conferences before in the past. Okay. Uh, Yeah. Um, I'm big into common law, jury trials, things like that. Um, and I'm really great to make contact with you again, and I'll try to send $25 through PayPal to hook up with your Tuesday conferences there. Let me tell you something about common law. Sure. Alfred, Alfred Knuth, who's the head of the Rules Committee, in, in volume 34, page 325 of the Federal FRD, which is Federal Rules of Decision. in 1966, merged law, equity, and admiralty all together under the federal rules of civil procedure. There was 86 admiralty maritime rules, pure maritime rules. They merged them with the federal rules of civil procedure. So all of the rules of civil procedure are admiralty maritime law. Yeah, that, that merges with the railroad case decision, right? Right. What they did is they changed uh, what Erie, and I read the Erie just I read 500 law reviews on the Erie decision, and I haven't met one person that understands Erie. And if you want me to, I'll, I'll explain to you what Erie did, really, what really happened in Erie. They changed. I'd sure like to hear your version, but I, I, I do think I've got a fair handle on it. I'm a student of Schweitzer. Yeah, Albert Schweitzer wrote it, wrote the article. Oh, what happened Ooh, to the federal jurisprudence? He's a, a, a member of the American Bar Association. Leroy Schweitzer, Montana Freeman. Oh, Leroy Schweitzer. Okay, Albert Schweitzer wrote an article on it. He explains, it's that the only law review I've read that explains what, what happened in Erie. They applied okay, the well, same yeah. equity before Erie, but not the common they're, they're, They changed it from English common law to federal common law. Under Swift versus Tyson, which Joseph Story decided, he, to, to, to cover up what they did, they said that uh, Joseph Story had been misapplying the rules of decisions under the common law for the last 150 years in the Swift versus Tyson. Yeah, I know there was problems with Story. So what happened? Oh, no, he was the greatest jurist that, uh, on Admiralty that ever lived. He yeah, said, he didn't know common law. Up bucket of water into my court with a corn cob in it, and I'll impose the admiralty on it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard of tricks like that they do. But what they did is, and I'll explain to you it this way. I read 500 different law reviews, and Tom, Harry Tompkins was walking along the right-of-way of a railroad track. 
and a door was open on one of the boxcars and knocked him under the train and cut his arm off, his right arm. So he sued Erie Railroad for liability, and they said that they were liable, and they awarded him $30,000. So they appealed it up to the district court. No, this was in the district court. They appealed it up to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals affirmed it. They went up to – then they did surgery to the U.S. Supreme Court, and that's when Louis Brandis re reversed it. He said that they had been misapplying – and to cover up what they did, which is they changed the rules of decision. And what they changed it to, they changed, if you read, if you go into the California Civil Code, it says in 23.3, the rules of decisions in all the states, or 22.3, excuse me, of the California Civil Code, it says the rules of decisions in all the courts of California is the common law as it came out of England. Yeah, the Oregon's the same. Uh, is, is the rules of decision. What they did is they changed the English common law for, to federal common law. I can show you a decision that was decided the same day as Erie that says, uh, and we can go in, I don't want to go into too much tonight, but it says that, that 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 there is a federal. They said there was no federal general common law. Then he turned around the same day and said there was a federal general common law. Yeah. So, what they, so what they did is they changed the rules of de, of decisions in all the courts. So they, they added a layer of confusion. And that's because they removed money from circulation. Yeah. You can't have common law when you have no money. Sounds right. And that's what I found to be true. Well, where, 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 where do you see all this going, Gene? Do you see your technologies or anything helping to produce uh, broad-based fundamental change that will help us save the nation from the pit of hell that it's drifting into? You know what hell is? I like to think so. It's kind of an abyss of darkness and confusion at minimum, maybe fire. That's one hundred percent true. But do you know who you know who Harry Blackstone is? You ever read William Blackstone? Harry, the uh, laws of England? Well William Blackstone. Uh, yeah. laws oh, excuse me, William Blackstone. Yeah, yeah, okay. I know him well. Okay, William Blackstone says that hell is debtor's prison. <laughs> Well, I, I think there's theologians that can make a good argument that it's more than just a debtor's prison. But um, yeah, I, I think I comprehend the concept. Yeah, debt. Well, the whole commercial debt realm is uh, can be metaphored into a, a, a circular abyss into which um, all of this corruption and pedophilia with Pizza Gate and everything, all of it sucks into a black hole where you know it's all under the jurisdiction of the devil. Yeah, but when you get into the Rule 16, if you when you get into Section 16 of the Coinage Act, it says anybody who debases this coinage shall upon conviction suffer death. When you debase, when you debase the coinage, you undermine the whole moral fabric of society, and that's what you're saying. Yeah. It's not going to change until you until you go back to lawful money. But they're going to be forced. Yeah, well, they're going to be forced I, I, I think it. that's within our power. I think if we hyperinflate through discharging debts, through our power to create uh, debt discharging instruments under the UCC, I think that will naturally, as all of the paper money uh, becomes uh, uh, like after in Germany after the wars. Uh, wheelbarrow full of money um, uh, uh, only buys a loaf of bread. At that point, people will naturally start reverting to gold and silver coin, as opposed to all of these paper money promises that are circulating. Yeah, that's what they do with the continental dollar. Same thing. Yeah. Well, so if we can figure out a way to to have a system of commerce based on promises to pay gold and silver coin, then um, 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 that would be a, a social safety net 
um, to back up this hyperinflating uh, black hole pit of hell that we're falling into through the hyperinflated Federal Reserve note system that we're under. If you read your deed of trust and your note, that's what it says. It'll pay an awful money at maturity. Yeah, but they, well, <laughs> I don't know how that the works. U.S. means, units of silver. We have adopted the Spanish mill dollar as the unit of measurement under the Quartet yeah, Act of 1792. Yeah. That's what the dollar is. It's, a, it's an intangible unit of measurement. Yeah, and, it, and it's and it's of intrinsic value. It's it's based right. in, in natural law concepts of barter. Um, yeah, uh, it has it, intrinsic it, value. The function is money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. so let's um, move on, gentlemen. All right, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll be trying to link up with you on your Tuesday evening calls, there, Gene. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Please do. Yeah, bye, Thanks, Charles. Bye. Yeah. Okay, next up is Missouri Republic. Go ahead. You've been unmuted. unmuted. Hello, Angela. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I, can. I can. Greetings to you and the host, Mr. Keating. Are you on Are a speakerphone? Because, because we're getting... Let yep, me yep. turn off my speaker. Just a moment. Okay. okay. All right. Now that will reverb. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Keating, uh, your information has been a pleasure to hear. I've been aware of your work for decades or more. Angela, you're doing as good work as well. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you if you know anything about a Supreme Court case involving American Insurance Company and 356 bales of cotton where the yeah, Supreme I'm Court I'm ruled I'm that a tribunal of five men and a notary was a higher venue than any corporate government entity, and their corporate jurisdiction had no authority over the people who are the superiors and the sovereigns. Uh, give me the name of the case, and I'll look it up. Now, did you hear that? Yeah, go ahead. Are you there? I don't know oh, what happened to him. Happened. Where'd uh, you go? Oh, there you well, are. My volume got turned down and I can't hear you. Oh. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. we're here. Uh, can you hear me? But I hear the echo. Uh, when I turn the volume down, you seem to can't hear my microphone. I'm we turning it up and you. down. My microphone volume is going up and down. Can you hear me going up and down? No, you sound pretty steady. Did you hear my question? Yeah, I got yeah, Wait a minute. Nobody else can hear the answer, though. Oh, God. I will say it with the microphone down. Okay. The American Insurance Company versus, three, versus 356 bales of cotton. January 1st, 1828 a Supreme Court decision, and it involves jurisdiction, and the government cannot trump the sovereign. Trump, or uh, the sovereign is over the government, and that's what this is involving. Uh, are, are you aware of this case? Or yes. Yes, yes I'm, I'm aware, I'm aware, of, it. aware of it. I'm going to keep my mic off and listen. I'd have, have to, to re-read re the case. Every, 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 things every, things every, things every, things every, 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 We're getting an echo in the background. Yeah, you know, this not working out with your you speakers on. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I can't hear him now. He's got something wrong with his... Uh, I'm trying to pull you up on two computers where I'm talking on one computer and listening on another. And hopefully it won't interfere. Why can't you do both on, on one. one computer? Why do you have to do it on two computers? Well, I'm talk to you pro on one computer and normal oh. talk to you on the other. Um, 
Did you hear the question, G? I was able to get the stream on the other on the other computer yeah. or talk to you. Heard the, uh, I heard it I well. Because I can't log in. All right, in. Let, let him answer you. Turn the volume back up and try and uh, okay, see if I can hear what you're saying. Okay. okay. Angela? I'm muting you out while Gene answers you so that we don't get the feedback. Go ahead, Gene. Okay, you're saying that, but that's it. You're talking about an 1828 decision. That probably doesn't have any application today. And that, that case involves a claim of salvage. Uh, it involves salvage of cargo and and what they call a restitution. Okay, let me see. I just pronounced the name. Gene, are you there? Yeah, here's what they ruled. Okay. It says the, 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 the decision of the circuit court is erroneous inasmuch as the said tribunal at Key West was not legally organized nor of competent jurisdiction in the premises. Number one, because the Constitution and the laws of the United States are of full force and effect within the territory of Florida. Well, this is when t Florida was a territory, not a, not a state. And second, because jurisdiction of salvage was not a rightful subject of legislation with the Floridian government, and the wrecking law enacted by the same is in various respects inconsistent with the said constitution and the laws. Because the superior, number three, is the superior courts of the said territory are vested with plenary and exclusive jurisdiction over all admiralty and maritime cases. And this was a case of that description. Fourth, because even if the jurisdiction says the courts was confined to cases arising under the Constitution and laws of the United States, this was a case of that class. Five, because the said courts were vested with original cognizance of all in all cases where the amount issued exceeded the value of one hundred dollars. Uh, let's see. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, they wanted to steal the money that they got from the 356 bales of cotton. And the, the regular district court overturned it and said, okay, we're going to give half to the insurance company. Then the appeals court, which the uh, insurance company said, we are not happy with that. We want all the money. The appeals court said they were going to give all the money to them. Then they went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, Supreme court said, no. The insurance company gets nothing because this was decided by the sovereign and the people with the county notary on the public private on a private level. It's where government and private people and sovereigns cannot interact. It's like Yikwo versus Hopkins and all these other big cases. I'm gonna just leave it at that and see if you have a response. I'm trying to share as much as possible in as short amount of time as possible. And you have the floor. Okay, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna have to finish reading the case to find out how they ruled. You probably won't have time to go over it tonight. No, nope, we've got a whole bunch of people. There's still eight or nine people in line to ask you questions. How are you doing, Gene? Are you up for it? Yeah, go ahead. All right, next up is uh, East Virginia. 
Go ahead, East Virginia. You've been unmuted. East Virginia, you've been unmuted. Perhaps your phone is muted. You fell asleep. I mean, I don't know. East Virginia, okay, I'm going to mute you back out. If you figure it out, press star 8 again, and I'll unmute you. Central Florida, go ahead. You've been unmuted. Thank you. Um, thank you, Angela. Can you hear me okay? Well, yes, uh-huh. Okay, I hope it sounds good in Jean. Uh, uh, oh, gotta, my God. It sounds like you're underwater all of a sudden. What are you, gargling with glycerine? <laughs> no, am, I, am I sounding okay? It's wavy. Go ahead. Try it now. I'll try it. Yeah, because I've been hearing some of that, and I might have to call back in and try again. Um, quick points I wanted to go over. Jean, you mentioned 5490000 <laughs> you do it. You clean it up. Uh, uh, <laughs> say the last word again. Four hundred ninety thousand. What? You mentioned five million four hundred ninety thousand. What is that? If we don't Unified, make that much. Unified tax credit. Unified. Oh, that means you have, to, tax. you have to. You have to earn more than that to have a taxable income. That much of your income is exempt from taxation. Where does it say that, Gene? Publication 950. Publication 950? Yeah, the IRS code. Okay. Do I sound okay? Do I sound better now? Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned uh, classes of law. You're in my light, William. Uh, it was trust, tax, commercial. There was one more I missed. Uh, there's uh, trust law, tax law, commercial law, and accounting. And accounting? Accounting. You got to know FASB and IASB. Okay. You mentioned I, article. FASB is the Financial Accounting Standard Board of Regulations. IASB is the International Accounting Standard Board. Then you got to learn GAAP, General Acceptable Accounting Principle. Okay, and you mentioned Article 8 of what? Is that Article 8 of the UCC? Yes. Okay, I got a timeline of things, uh, and if you want me to pause, just say pause, and I'll let you comment. I wasn't arrested, but uh, someone was, but I'm going to play it as me. I was arrested, taken to the jail. They issued me an enemy accounting transcript they took $14 and say I owe 18 That's a financial instrument they created. The bottom line is they created a bond receipt and forced me to sign it, and on the receipt it says, I am the sum above received by this bond taken and approved by me. Basically, they made me create a bond for $3,000. Can I uh, remove that, or how do I object to that? To get out of jail. Well, what do, you, what do you mean? Are you in jail now? No. I got out. I paid the $300 to the bondsman. But before I got out, they created this bond receipt. Did they, they called it. Did they file against you? I don't know that. All I know is I got a bond receipt. Whether they filed anything, I don't, I don't know. Did you go into court and enter a plea? Not yet. That comes the 14th of this month. Ask them if they have a claim against you. Yeah, we haven't got we haven't got a complaint or anything in the mail as far as saying we claim that you owe the, us this or you did this, and it doesn't. We, we haven't got anything else except the the papers they handed me in jail. Okay, did you ask to be taken before a magistrate before you have posted the bond? No, I didn't know any better to ask that. Well, they have to take you before a magistrate, and you ask them to declare the issue. Okay, so what happened was uh, uh, my friend posted to pay the bondsman $300 to get me out, and the bondsman had me sign a bunch of paperwork, which I could go over uh, 
and I signed everything from the bondsman, all rights reserved, which I don't know if that helped me or not, but that's how I did it. But the bondsman had me sign a promissory note for the three for three thousand. When do you have to go back to court? The fourteenth, March. Tell me why you move for a dismissal on the grounds that they don't have a complaint against you. Well, I think they're going to give me a complaint on that day when I show up. Well, they make them read it into the record to declare the issue. Okay. They will not do it. And if they don't do it, what happens? Then they you have to nope. dismissal. Okay, because they will probably uh, uh, demand I plea and set a trial date is what they'll probably do. So I got to be forceful in my objection. Well, then no, you, 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 you are, you're accepting their offer to enter a plea on a, a contingent on their declaring the issue in open court. I accept your offer to plea on the condition that you read the complaint. That you, the that you read the complaint. The they have to read it in the record. They will not do it. Okay. Now that's what I needed to know because they got now. Now if they when they dismiss this, all this bond stuff and everything is gone. But uh, all that, all they basically did was issue a bunch of financial instruments and then tell me to show up to court. I have even had to call the court and find out wh where the room is, when, and everything, because they didn't give me any of that. I don't have anything at all to, to do this. So, and I'm going to do your class. I, I'm glad I tuned in tonight, and uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Angela. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Let's see who we got here. Hold on a second. My uh, thing isn't working for some reason. Oops. I just muted myself. I'm trying to bring up the... Um, okay, well, I could just do it this way, I guess. I've got this magnifier up again, and it's making me crazy. Okay, let's see here. Michelson... Are you local? Oh. What? <laughs> Hello. I don't think so. Go ahead, Michael. Soon you've been unmuted. Hello, Angela. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Gene. How are you, Gene? It's a pleasure and an honor, man. I've been reading about you for about seven years now. Uh, I, I I read your treatise. Fabulous, fantastic. Um, I had a question about uh, uh foreclosure. Um, uh, my parents have gone to foreclosure for about the last couple years. Um, it's at the stage where where they they did a non judicial sale. It's in California. Um, they did a non judicial sale and now it's it's in the eviction process. What can I do at this stage? Hello? You're, you're in the eviction process? <clears throat> That's correct. Have they done rid of possession? What's that? Have they issued a writ of possession? No. What they did today, as a matter of fact, I went to the uh, premises, the property, and, and they put a, a, a paper, a notice, saying something about personal property, and I had, like, so many days to claim it. Some 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 knockoff attorney, some, uh, yeah, so... I, I, I'm just wondering if I could even file like them forms, the standard form 90 and, and, and 91 in the court, maybe, or or what, what would you suggest, Gene? It's a tax issue, right? You need to do a payment order to the secretary and release the lien to, to the uh, secretary of treasury. Yeah, it's a backup. The the uh, whoever's doing the foreclosure is acting as a backup of holding agent for the secretary of treasury. Okay. So when you do the payment to the Secretary of Treasury, he releases the lien. And what form do I use? The the 1040V? Yeah, use the 1040V, and, and a, a, you got to get the uh, uh, the account number and get a piece of paper that says you 
that says something about you owing the money to the bank. Okay. And do, and do a payment order to the Secretary of the Treasury, and he will release the lien. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What bank? I mean, who's, what, is this a, a federal K, is this IRS taxes or property taxes or state taxes? No, what is, no. It, no, it's it, for, for closure. Yeah, let, let me give you oh. a recap, which, which you're going to get a kick up. Back in 2007, my parents got suckered into a refi, right, by a, okay. by, by a company named Taylor Wynn Whitaker down in South Florida. Well, evidently, two years after, they ended up in prison for mortgage fraud. They're, they're, they're doing like 30 years in federal prison. Well, during the next couple of years, the loan was in limbo. And then all of a sudden, uh, my parents get a notice of, of, of an assignee, some, some serving scene agent for like a couple years. And then all of a sudden, they just filed a, a, a trustee, uh, uh, notice of trustee, um, what should we call it? Uh, I want to say a sale. Out. Yeah, a- actually, uh, a, a notice of default from the trustee. And this happened in 2014. It's been going on since like 2009, actually. If you go in and I told them what what I told them. I said I said stop paying the mortgage because they're not producing any note. But you know in California it doesn't like like they don't even oblige by that. Yeah, but they don't have a note. No, they don't. They never did. I mean, believe me, Gene. I fought these people for years, back and forth, back and forth. And and to make a long story short, I was incarcerated for and and that's the reason I couldn't I couldn't really. Uh, uh, attack them the way I wanted to, and that's and, and that's how I learned everything about you when I was in there. I learned that your 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 treatise. I learned the UCC. I mean, I learned. I studied a lot. Put it that way. Ah, uh, yes, the underground school of prisons. I love it. Yeah, yeah. So so it's a, it, it's an honor even to be talking to you. But anyway, anyhow, going back to the foreclosure. Um, yeah, the, you know that's what was interesting about it. That these people, you know, they 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 sucker my parents into this. Uh, a bad refi, and they ended up in prison. the The loan was in limbo. Um, all of a sudden, you know, this new uh, uh, servicing agent comes in, files the paperwork, files the notice of default, and now we're there at the eviction stage. Um, I don't know what to do. I'm thinking about doing the 1040, like you said, Gene. Um, I want to sign up in your class on Tuesday night so I can have more clarification on how to do these forms to uh, the Secretary of Treasury. Yeah. So let's see what he has to say. Yeah, what do you suggest, Gene? Yeah, do a payment order, but you have to know how to do it. Right. I've got the form. I do, I show you how to do it and everything. Okay. Now, it's what do you think about have, these? It's good, huh? it's good to have if you got PDF converter. Yep. If, if you've got uh, Acrobat Pro ten or eleven, or if you got Acrobat Pro DC, you have to be able to convert the. The instrument, you have to be able to edit it in a PDF file. Okay, gotcha. In other words, you click on it, and then it allows you to edit it, and you can actually type on it. Right, okay. What do you think about these? Um, I know uh, Tony King talks about the 90 and the 91 and the 28. What do you think about that? Well, he learned all that from me. Yeah, I know. That's 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 what I was asking or inquiring and see if that will work. Just yeah, just to kind of you, you you can but why do all that when you can? It's a tax issue. Right. Well, so pay the tax and then they have to release the property. Okay. The, all these banks. You know what I mean by all, ALL? Absolutely. All these people that do foreclosures are backup withholding agents for the IRS. Mm-hmm. Yep. Why? Yep. Because because it's a tax issue. It's a tax issue. You're absolutely right, and you're on point. And you're right, Gene. People need to read out there and wake up. They don't read anything. They don't read crap. I I know. Every time you you reiterate that, I'm like, you know what? He's absolutely right. And it's not just reading. You got to comprehend what you're reading. Right. All the provisions, especially the tax code. I mean, you see, Title Twenty Six is it's aisles and aisles of books. Well, it's a class five gift and estate tax, which means you have a five million dollar exclusion. So if you don't owe any taxes, and they're alleging you do, and that's because that's the tax represents the amount of your credit they're using. Your credit. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep, I do. Trying to say it's taxable income. 
Now, Gene, let me ask you a question. If if this loan was under my parents' name, would I need like a uh, if, and if I'm doing a 1040V, what do I need to represent them? Well, you need a power of attorney. Okay, I already got that. Well, okay. now I mean, trust me. When I was fighting these people back and forth, I was all always stipulating on my um, on my I guess pleadings or or or, or letters saying authorized representative of of for example my mother's name, you know, obviously. Um, okay, so just a POA will do, right? Or you can say you're the attorney in fact. That's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, attorney in fact. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. Um, wow. Well, I'm gonna do this. Maybe um, I'm gonna take your class on Tuesday night, and maybe you can show me how to, to uh, fill this form out, and uh, then I can follow it maybe Wednesday morning. Stop this whole thing because they're giving me till the 19th to get all the property out, like all the personal property out of the. the uh, Either that, or they're uh, gonna have to give you the property because they can't take both the property and the note. They have to give you it back. And nobody demanded. See, you never demanded a surrender of the instrument. Right. No, they never did. Nobody did. They just well, kept uh they kept don't know that. Yes, you can do that. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Um, like I said, I'm gonna take your class on Tuesday night. I got one more quick question since I have you on the phone here. You know how I just said I was incarcerated? I did my bid. I'm on probation now. How do I get rid of that completely? Get it expunged? No. No. You want to get it expunged? Is that what? Yeah, yeah. Basically, you know, pretty much I want it off. You know, I know, I know you uh, sometimes. Um, I guess um, I know Tony Bank talked about the ninety to ninety one, going back to that, and and the twenty four, twenty five a. Would it be that process to actually race the the, the felony and, and get a a ten ninety nine O I D on it or? Well, that's 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 under the FAR regulations. Those are forms for federal acquisitions. Right. There's about three thousand pages. Yeah. What is it, like fifty three point something? Yeah. Federal acquisition rules. Right. Government right. federal acquisitions. That's what the two seventy three, two seventy four, two seventy five. All that. Yeah. Will that work at this point? I mean, I already done the whole time. Well, you're dealing with a tax issue. Not Again, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. so you, what you want to do is re release the tax. Right. So pay it, zero out the receivables, and then they'll have to give you the property back. Right. And that will and that will do a a, a ten forty V again. Huh. Yeah, you do a that's a payment voucher. Oh, a payment a voucher. V pay, payment voucher, and then you do a payment order. You don't have to file a return because it's not over $5 million. Right. I haven't seen a mortgage yet that's over $5 million. No. In fact, I haven't seen too many over a million. Yeah. Two or three that I've seen that are over a million. Okay. All right. Well, definitely then, um, I guess 1040V is the, the, the key to my problem here. Huh? Yeah, you want to show you paid the tax, so now they have to release because it's a tax issue. That's why, and nobody right. does that because they don't know it's a tax issue. Why is this a tax issue? Okay. Okay, Angela, thank you very much, Gene. It's a pleasure. Why is the tax issue? What's that? I'm asking you a question. Go ahead, Gene. You know why it's a tax issue? Yeah, it's it's it's, in, it's, it's a security. Because there's no money. No. Yeah. No. It's not it's it's not a note. <laughs> it's, a, it's a security that's and there's no money. There's no lawful money out there. Well, what does that got to do with the tax? Well, everything's a tax. Yeah, that's true. They are, you know, like you said, and all the banks are run pretty much. Okay. Why, well, why, did, why, why is there, why does it involve a tax? 
Um, the way I know it is that everything's a tax, that's and true. that's how. Why, why is everything a tax? I don't know. <laughs> well, how are you going to fill out the forms if you don't know? Yeah, that that's the reason I'm going to take your class on Tuesday night. <laughs> well, let me tell you why it's a tax. Because they didn't return interest back to principal. What does income mean? It means inc- it means income coming to you. To the principal. To the principal. Right. Gap. When principal circulates, it's called interest. When it's returned back to principal, it's called principal. And when principal is venue. And, and it's go back to revenue. Interest. When you return interest back to principal, it's revenue. So you're returning mm-hmm. revenue back to the principal. They never did that. That's why it's a tax issue. Oh, okay. It has nothing to do with a mortgage. Right, right. That's to do with the counting. It has to do with the counting. It's all accounting because there's no money. Yeah, it's all what tax. Is the, what is the issue? The receivables. You have receivables that says you owe money to a bank. You've already made the payment. They didn't credit the payment to the receivables to balance out the books. Right. Credit and debit. That, they show that interest is due on the principal. Or revenue. Revenue's due. So when you right. zero revenue. out the account, there's no revenue. It's all uh, uh, ge- general accounting accrual principles gap. Right. Okay. They didn't credit your payment that was made at closing. If you go into your uh, county clerk's office and look at the miscellaneous files, you'll find a satisfaction of mortgage and lien under 2941.7 of the California Civil Code. 2947? Yeah. If you don't find one, fill it out and, and file it. Okay. Go to the 20, 2941.7 of the California Civil Code. It's a, it's a satisfaction of lien and reconveyance. I think I've seen those. Yeah, I've seen, those, uh, I've seen that somewhere. I think I've seen it in uh, some filing I did, and then they got returned to me, and it gives you, like, certain uh, uh, sections. And I, I remember reading about it, but satisfaction of uh, – what was it called again? Satisfaction of lien and release of mortgage. Release of mortgage, yep. So if there's none, I I could just file it. If there's no record of any any satisfaction of release of mortgage, I could file that. I would do the I would do the payment first and then then file that. Okay, so do a 1040B first and then do the satisfaction of of. Uh, Lean release of mortgage. You better read real good what you're doing before you do anything and understand it because you can get into big trouble if you file a release of lien and you're not the lien person that filed it. Okay. That's why you got to get the release of lien, which is a tax for fraud or something. Mm. What was that, Gene? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. You have a tax lien. That's why you got to do the payment first. Okay. So, so you do the payment voucher first, and then you do the uh, satisfaction of uh, a lien of mortgage. Right. Okay. And how fast is that process, Gene? Like the the the, the 1040 V. Hello. What is your, what's your question? What's how that? long does it take after you do that? Yeah. How long does it take after you file a 1040 D? How quick can you do it to the secretary? Uh, probably after I take your course on Tuesday night, Wednesday Wednesday morning I'm doing it. This coming Wednesday. All right. Let's well, move on. It's overnighted. You should overnight it to the secretary. Okay. Yeah, well, he's got to learn how to do it right first. Yeah. Okay. This is well, true. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thanks, Dean. Angela, thank you very much. You guys have a good night. Welcome. Thank you. You too. Hey, next up, uh, guest 168. Go ahead. You've been unmuted. Yes. yes. We're going to have to wrap this up. Okay. I'm I'm going to be real fast. I called earlier and I shared some information. Um, Just listen to that caller. Jane and everybody got absolutely right. It has to do with the county. This is why I say one should bind their entity to the county, which will allow them to be harm, be held harmless and exempt from taxes, which is income, considered revenue because of the state. But I want to say this, too. Anyone who's going through a foreclosure shall issue a bond in the court, which will be put among the court general funds which will allow the court to issue a general default order that comes out of the general fund from the court. Now, as I just stated, if you bind your foreclosure case for the amount that uh, uh, a lying lawyer or an attorney who's pretending to be the bank because they never, ever really have a contract with the bank to do what they're doing, if you bond the court case, the foreclosure case, it's going to go away. The judge is going to give a default order. He's not going to give a default order without the word general. You need them to say general default order because your bond is going into a general fund, and they will pay whatever it is to make everything go away once you issue that bond in the court case. I hope you, you, y'all, everybody's hearing what I'm saying or understand what I'm saying because this kills all foreclosures. See, the, the problem was everybody had a promissory note to get a, a house or a loan or a car, and they gave a, they didn't give an endorsement on the back, which is to pay to the order of whoever they are uh, giving the notes to or the promissory note to. And because we don't give an endorsement, which is... Uh, uh, instructions on the back of an instrument, it ends up being what everybody keeps saying, this word assignment. But see, it's, it's assignment by default because you did not turn over the promissory note at the closing table and say pay to the order of whoever it is to make the promissory note go straight to the one who puts the lien on it, which is the treasury. No bank or nothing, because there's no money, ever lien your house. Everyone do that UCC 111 or whatever that is to see if there's a lien. Well, there's no lien only from the Treasury, and there's only that lien because we don't have sense enough to turn over the note and give a proper endorsement, which is instructions. Just writing a name on the back or on the front is a blank endorsement, even with your regular checks. You must give instructions on the back. Now, I really hit the key to come back to talk because I have loved ones that's on the call and they saying that you didn't really answer or speak upon what I shared with you earlier pertaining to this is all about the law of agency and partnership whereas though we all been issued a registered certificate I mean a full faith and credit registered certificate bond which municipalities calls general obligation bonds. See it's all our duty as a civil officer, as an attorney, in fact, to bond ourselves to the county to be held harmless. Without that bond, there is no contract. Therefore, as I said earlier, no one has standings to speak in court. Can you do me a favor and email me? I'd like to talk to you more about this. I'd like to have you on as a guest speaker. That way you can get into depth. No, I'm not going to do the guest speaker. I used to do... A lot of this talking on you're live, doing on it the now. Radio. Yes, because <laughs> it's, 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 I'm hearing all this stuff, and like I say, once you bond it to county, now the county duty is to make sure your uh, how do what I kind of, what kind of a bond are you using? Well, it's just a regular bond. Understanding it doesn't matter. All bonds are performance bond, surety bond, or whatever. But I just told you it's called a general obligation bond, which is a full faith and credit bond from your certificate. Without a contract, 
you can't do anything. So once you contract your person or your entity to the county with a general obligation bond, which is a full faith and credit bond, the county's duty is to make sure you're uh, applying or um, under the state and local government laws. They have to keep you afloat with all the laws. So, like I say, this is all about contract, for which we don't have. No one has any standings to speak because there is no contract. All right? That's all this is. Once you put a contract in, you ain't got to worry about none of that UCC crap, none of that stuff. All right? You don't have to worry about none of that. All that is for the fictions to usurp you. You don't need to know that stuff if you understand contract. All right? The bottom line is no one has a contract to the certificate of birth, which is a full faith and credit bond of the United States, which is their obligation through the agency called the state of Florida, state of New York, or whatever. So I'm telling everyone who's going through a foreclosure case right now, look up general obligation bond, create a general obligation bond, and put it in the court case. The judge, you ain't even going to have to be there. They're going to do a general default order because that bond went into their general fund, and they're going to take care of it, and you will get your title within two to three weeks after the court situation. See, is, there a form for do, is there a form for doing that, general obligation bond? Say that again. Is there a form, a form for doing the general obligation bond? Well, I created my own general obligation bond, understanding what a bond is. A bond is just simply saying, knowing all about these presents, that I, for a entity. See, the problem is, when we create a promissory note of bond, the maker is the state who issued you the certificate, not you. And everybody got it backwards. The principal is always the dead entity, not you. You have life. The dead entity is the principal because that's the slave to the life. That's the cardinal mind to the spiritual mind, which spiritual means mental. So when everyone understands their spirituality or spiritual mind, which is mental, they act accordingly. They stop worshiping idols, claiming to be from a dead state, and act within the state that they are because it's all about habit at act which is the word habitation and because everybody habitation is inhabitant therefore they're inhabited and embodied by an entity they have no standings so once you comprehend who you are and you issue a contract which is basically a bond everything else will be smooth sailing i'm telling y'all you ain't got to worry about none of this crap because that only applies to dead, carnal-minded, natural persons. No man, female or male, on this call should ever consider themselves a person. The word natural as a noun signifies you're an idiot, and that's what they're claiming. Everyone's a natural idiot person. Got to start recognizing the term of words and speak truly. If you speak, with words in a proper use, a fake acting judge cannot give you his opinion. They only give you opinion because of the words that's being said or used even by your attorney don't make sense. Therefore, they give an opinion. They can't give an opinion if your word is direct, where it's official to the term. See, in the manner that I speak, I speak with proper English. Therefore, I never have to worry about an opinion from an actor. All right? But I need for you to elaborate to everyone that's listening because I hear everybody giving you high praise. You got to let them know that this is strictly about the law of agency and partnership. This is what this is all about. Everyone is considered a general partner because you have no contract. Therefore, you're a beneficiary, and a beneficiary is one who contributes. Everybody should want to know that they are a beneficial owner, not a beneficiary. That's another word that everybody uses that 
They already are. Beneficiary means you're a slave. That signifies you're contributing to this capitalism, which is nothing but a sin system, a usury from off another for profit or gain. So I only call back because, like I said, I have loved ones who's like, yo, Gene ain't really elaborating, didn't answer or say, you know, because they really want to hear yo opinion, which I really don't do opinions. I'm speaking from knowledge, from the comprehension of words. But because people, you know, fellow man acting as people, know who you are for the last few years, they need to hear from you. So I call back to ask you to elaborate on the fact that this is all about the law of agency and partnership. See, the is short for theos, which is Greek for God. So God's law from agency and partnership is what this is all about. And the first original trust is the trust that you have in your tabernacle called the body from the spirit of the almighty God. That's the real trust. The spirit is the agency. Your body is the agent. Okay? Everybody just got to understand this is about words and theos, law of agency and partner. Who are you a partner for? Are you a partner for the spirit within you, which is a Lord, or you claim to be under a body corporate politic? Through one, it's a turn, and a term signifies to transfer homage from one Lord, which is the spirit within you, to this fake entity, fate. And this is what this is all about. Stop idol worshiping, and everything will be fine. Read the provisions in the Holy Scripture, because all law comes from that book. And if you can really read and understand that the Scriptures is nothing but parables, Allegoric parables that's teaching you mental truths, everybody will be fine. But people take it literal. See, people speak in parables, all right, and take the Bible literal. But the Bible ain't meant to take literal. It says parables. And a parable is par, which is equal and able ability. Parables give you an ability, uh, equal ability if you understand the words, and it will raise you, all right? We don't want to be descendants from an ancestry connected to Adam, which is a sinner. You want to be an ascending kindred, not a descendant. See, that word descend, I'm not a descendant. I have no ancestry because no man, flesh and blood, is my father. The spirit within me, which is allowing me to have the mental capacity to speak to you, is my father. So... I just need for you to elaborate more to ones who's been following you for years and simplify this because all that other talk means absolutely nothing. That's legal, and I'm talking law. Legal is contract. Right? Legal is contract for which there is no contract. Just that simple. You ain't got to go through no, jumping through no hula hoops, Worrying about no dead uniform commercial code coming from a dead entity of dead statues from a municipal corporation. Focus on who you really are from the spirit within. Learn words. Learn how to speak. Therefore, there will be no opinion, and your word will be bond, and you will walk through anything. See, they don't want me coming in their courtrooms or nothing because of the manner that I speak. I speak in the absolute truth that cannot be rebutted. And that's the key to this. Words is the key to this. See, as Scripture says, in the beginning was the Word and was with God, and it became flesh, which means carnal-minded people speaking words that makes no sense. But when you speak with words that make sense, now the Word has become God again. Because the word Elohim, E, Elohim, is the word. All right? It's all about the word. And we got to understand that everything is good, which is valid, V-A-L-I-D. All right? There is no bad, nothing. All evil is ignorance. The what did you want, Gene, to elaborate on? If you don't elaborate mind. on the law 
of agency and partnership because you spoke on it when I first talked about it for a second, but you went way out in left field. It's just simple. All they right, trust Jade, you. can you? They most definitely trust you, and I know if you elaborate and really explain this, people will stop being people. They'll be your fellow man. They'll catch on, and we we'll all start living life because one, you can have life without live, but you cannot live without life. Live is a condition that you've been put on. Life is all good. It's the breath. It's the spirit. All right, so. All I'm asking you to is elaborate on the law of agency and partnership because this is what this is all about. All um, right. That's what Jean, this is all about. thank but you so much. You can uh, give me an email, how you want to do this. I don't know because everybody else will be getting it too. But um, I will most definitely take your email, shoot you an email, because I would like to talk to Jean privately, all right, because, like I say, I'm, I'm a living proof of what I'm saying. I don't speak on nothing that I haven't done. All right. Everybody has the ability to pay anything or have anything discharged because pay is just discharged. Nothing is getting paid. But we just got to understand you have no contract in place to force performance from the other party. You're a voluntary party without any enforcement ability, without a contract. Once you put that contract in, they are forced to perform. And this is why within the last few weeks, me and a couple of my, well, one of my homies who I've shared this with is saving people cribs left and right because a note with a note kills everything. That's it's wonderful. Simple, yeah. the bond in the you case, know, I wish you'd come on and share all that information. Put a promissory <laughs> note to the <laughs> CFO of the fake bank who claims that you have a, you know, a dead pledge that you owe, which is the word mortgage, all right? But that's it, Jean. I've listened, I've read all your stuff and all that, the performance bond and all that. Well, like I said, I understood it's very simple. I know that I'm a man, and man is the spirit, not the body. Therefore, I'm truly mental. That's what it all comes down be mental. Stop acting like a person. Stop claiming to be an individual. Stop claiming to be a human because all those things hurt you. Stop being patriotism to an entity because that proves that you are a dead mental state. Scripture says you all, all of us has been put in the land of nod. See, we've all been put to sleep by our creator. Not anything outside of us. What's in us allowing us to be sleep because we're carnal minded. We vainly think of things and cause I mean reasonable ways of thinking to do what we want to do even if it's wrong. We gotta stop. We have to move on, guest one sixty eight. I do you right, have well, me, uh, what's, uh, what's your first I'll name? What's, what's your, your first name? You know, I don't like to give my email out over the uh, recording. I know for how we're going to do this. You could go to my website, myprivateaudio.com. Private audio. Myprivateaudio.com. Just like the call's title. <clears throat> Excuse me. Myprivateaudio.com. And just click on the contribution button. You don't have to contribute, but my uh, email is there. Most definitely would do that. I, I, I'll consider coming on and speaking, but I would like to come on and speak with me and Jean together. I would really okay. like that. I would be happy to host both of you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. What's your first name? I'm known as the Doc. The Doc. Okay, good. I'll wait to get your email. All right, sure. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. You too. Okay. Uh, let's see. We've got one, two, three, four, five more people in line to ask a question. I have to get off by 10 o'clock, so if we can make this quick, we can do all of them. But that's it. No more new uh, hands up. Okay, Money Mike, you've been unmuted. Oh, Mike. Yo, Mike, you've been unmuted. All right, well, maybe he went for a potty break. Um 
Put your hand up uh, when you figure it out, and I'll unmute you again. Jeffrey, one, two, five, three, four, go ahead. Jeffrey, one, two, five, three, four. Uh, yeah, my question to G- my question to Gene is what is he is it has Gene paid off the seventy three thousand dollar judgment against him he has in California? I don't have a judgment. You don't? Nope. September twenty first, twenty ten. The judgment from who? Uh, United States District Court, Central District of California, Eastern Division, Riverside. Twenty ten. I haven't even been in, in in court in twenty ten. I wasn't even in California. Really? You're getting bad information from somebody. Wrong, Gene Keating. Keating. Huh? So, what, so this is the wrong Gene Keating? Where did you, you get this information from? Uh, this is on PACER. Rancho Cucamonga, California, 91730. Not you? Rancho Cucamonga? Yeah. Well, that's a foreclosure case that I was involved in. That's that's up in uh, uh, San Bernardino County. All right. Well, the judgment was against you. Yeah, I got rid of all that. Oh, you got rid of it? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Is that it for you, yeah, Jeffrey? Yeah. Well, how, how do you get rid of it? How do you get rid of it, Gene? Uh, I sent him a bill as taxable income, and the judge dismissed the case. I can show you the letter I wrote to him. Uh, they, hey, what? Charged, they tried to tell me a, char- a, a court, they tried to ca- charge me court fees and attorney fees, which is taxable income. But like I've been trying to tell everybody, everything's a tax bill. They got rid of me so fast that you, that you got a cold for the breeze. <laughs> okay, move on. Let's go quad uh, 52108. Your turn. Okay. I was, um, I came in kind of late and I was hearing them talking about publication 940 or something. I wasn't sure. 950. 950. What what process is that is that utilized? Is that is that for like filing your taxes or something? I wasn't sure. Like I kind of caught the end of it. I didn't quite understand what was being said. Uh, I heard you say it was the IRS publication 950 uh, in regards to uh, taxable well, income. It's, or, uh, it's class five gift and estate taxes. Just type in uh, publication 950 2017, and it'll bring up the current the state tax. It'll tell you what it is for each year you unified tax credit. I'm saying is that something that you is that something that you file or No, it's it's you, read it. you have to claim it. <laughs> okay, you got a you, you... Then, you got a tax credit for five million not for because they're using your money to fund everything. So they exempt you from any taxes. That's why they don't want people to know this. That's why Alvin Brown asked me how I knew all that. He didn't say I was wrong and started attacking me. He says, how did, you, how did I find all this out? I said, well, I read the IDRS manual. He says, well, you're not supposed to be reading that. And I said, well, that's uh, why I read it. He says, go for a bitch. If you go up on the Internet, it's on the Internet. It's on the IRS website. No, when you say use only. Download it. Look, look over. Look at it for yourself. It says IDRS so say, ADP, Automated no. Data Processing Manual, sixty two oh nine. Okay. Now, when you say claim it, though, is, are you saying it's like that? They they refund you that amount, or is that they just take it off to where you don't have to pay any taxes for that? Well, you year? have that. 
it's like a deduction. A tax credit means that if you have any, let's say I receive $5 million, mm -hmm. I can offset that $5 million with that tax credit. Okay. So if I don't so, receive anything over $5 million, then I don't have any tax liability. And everything is a tax. They're not paying the taxes. Okay. So this like is this like the recipient is this, of the funds. So is this like you, a form like 709 or something that you that you filing yeah. with this or something? No, I don't file that. I do a 1040V. You don't have to file any tax forms because you don't have any taxable income. If you, you have over, have you ever made over five million four hundred ninety thousand dollars in one year? No. Uh -uh. Well, then you don't you you don't have to file. Okay, so when you say you file a ten forty B, exactly what do you file? What what do I what? When you say you, you say you don't have to file, but then you say you have to file a ten forty B. I'm trying. I'm trying to understand the process in regards to what what's being claimed. Well, the 1040V is a voucher. It's a payment it's, voucher. It's a payment I'm voucher. Yeah. Right. So, I'm saying, so if you're making a claim, why why is it a, why why is there a payment voucher being being submitted somewhere? To pay to discharge whatever to, the debt. Go ahead. I'm making a payment to the, the Secretary of Treasury. And that's what the that's what a payment voucher is for. I'm saying, you know, I'm saying you can what? pay your property taxes with a with a uh, with a voucher. They have a payment voucher. The Revenue and Taxation Board has a payment voucher for paying property taxes. No, okay. I mean, just just so just so I don't get off track in regards to I'm trying to just just still trying to understand about the the five billion some dollars uh, credit there. You said you make a well, you need to go. You need to read the publication. You need to read the publication, and it will explain to you what it is. And sign up for one of his classes, because we've got to end the call, and we still have two people left. And I'm okay, sorry you came what, in at the end, but you know we recorded the call, so you can listen to it in its okay, entirety. Okay. And, and, and when and when is when is the class? Tuesday On night, Tuesday? six o'clock p.m. PST, Pacific Standard yeah. Time. And where do I go to pull the class? Is there a call? You have to uh, email Brian. Um, wait, let's go back. i got to go all the way back here. JB uh, class, class, I think it's at Tutana, Tutanota. I gave yeah. her the email. Okay, it's... Wait a minute. It's here. I'll tell you what it is. Because yeah, I'm 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 a little familiar with 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 that in regards to that publication, and I know that in regards to to, to making that claim is like it's form seven oh nine, but I don't understand the process in regards to when you say you you make an payment with a ten forty voucher, you know, when when there's nothing to to pay, I guess so to speak. So that's what I'm a little confused on. Well, you got a receivable. How do you zero out a receivable? I just put yeah. his email address in the chat. Are you on the chat? No, I'm not on the chat. All right. You know what I'll do is I'll put it on the website, okay. but not tonight. I won't be able to do it till tomorrow. And what you do is you go to myprivateaudio.com, mm -hmm. click on guest speakers, and then click on Gene's name. Okay. And, that'll t and I'll put the links on that link. You click on his name. That way you can find the link. And okay. what you do is send an email to them and, uh, you know, ask for details and whatever you need to know. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to look for me with 6209 with that manual and read a little bit, but I just can't recall um, anything about the 1040B in regards to making some type of claim with that. So, all right, but I'll, uh, I'll definitely... Uh, Take take a listen in on your on your class there as well, Dave. Thank you so much. Good night. Okay, uh, next up, talk shoe nine oh one. Go ahead. Oh, I just want to know would guest one six eight would he be willing to give out his email address? Yeah, I'll give it out. Okay, go ahead. J E A N T 
see. No, no, I meant the guest wants to stay. He talks about the bond and law of agency. I want to know if he'd be willing to give out his email address. Oh, okay. I didn't know. Who? I have Mr. Keaton's email address. Okay, who you want? Who, whose email do you want? The guest that came, came in talking about the Oh, bond, the gentleman, the guest 168? Yes. Yeah, do you want to email. give out guest 168? Did you want to give out your email? No, I don't think you did, did you? No, I didn't give out my email. Um, did you want to? No, uh, no. What I'll do is, like I said, I'll contact you, and the, uh, <laughs> the lady can uh, contact you and that's something of that way. Um, I don't okay. want to get an email out. Well, I guess 168, I did want to learn what you were talking about. So if I send Mrs. Stark's email, can I communicate with you that way? Say that again. She <clears throat> wants, to, she wants to, to communicate with you. So. I'm trying to get them. Sure, well, I'm about to uh, I'm send out my computer Yeah, now. send me your email and I'll send it to I'll forward Once he, I get in touch with him, I'll forward your email to him, okay? Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I mean, I've got all this time in the world to do this, you know, so what the heck? All right, next up, Central Indiana. Go ahead. You've been unmuted. Central Indiana. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. Hello. Central Indiana. Okay. Did you have a question? Uh, Yes, I did. Thank you, Angela. You're welcome. And uh, Mr. Keating. Um, I got a couple of questions. The bankruptcy for the United States was in 1933, and I was under the impression that a bankruptcy could not last any longer than 75 years, which would bring us to 2008. Well, they've oh, never really? repealed. ATR 192 has never been repealed. It was modified in 1978. Say that one more time. It was modified in 1977. ACR 92 was. It was 31518D2. It was not repealed. I've heard a dozen people say that ACR 192 has been repealed. It has not been repealed. Okay. Just curious. But isn't that how it usually is? Is a bankruptcy only lasts 75, can only last 75 years, and then, then it has to be. Okay, uh, what, what is it based on? What do you base that on? Based on I, what? I read a law somewhere a long time ago about bankruptcy, and uh, that was what it said. But I, w- I was just asking you <laughs> for your opinion on that. I don't really, uh, you know. You know they're still bankrupt. They're debtors in possession acting as trustees to the bankrupt estate. Okay. They're insolvent. No, well, I believe that. There's There's Civitas Mortis. You know what Civitas Mortis is? No. It comes from Mortmain, which means dead hand. It comes from ecolastical and civil law. Uh Uh-huh. All corporations, companies, or associations that are insolvent or bankrupt are are naturally and legally dead. Are you getting that? Naturally and legally dead. Okay. Yeah, I, I know something. I've got actual wrong. Supreme Court decisions that say that. Okay. That means they don't even exist. Sure. Now, so how are all these banks that are insolvent loaning money to people? Oh, you got me. I mean, I, it's, it's crazy. I, I don't have the answers. I, that's why I tuned in tonight was to get some of them. Well, that and, that, that shows you how out of t- touch with reality the people are. You right. know, they're, they're, they're devoid. Totally void of any reality. Right. And I looked up the tax unified or the unified tax credit and I was kinda of looking it up while you were talking and that where I went to find the you know, I picked one of them, it was uh free you know, uh, free advice legal. And it said that uh and I know I heard you say earlier that you know, it has to do with the estate and gift tax, but that the ten forty is in the same Statute is that? Is that what it, it's what you said earlier? Yeah, the ten forty is a uh, class five gift and estate tax. Well, how in the hell do they put all these people in jail when it's this? I mean, it, apparently this simple to figure out, and all these people are sitting in prison for taxes when I don't understand no, how it's they. It's that simple to figure out. How come nobody knows it? 
Uh, well, you've known it for how many years? Well, yeah, but who outside of me knows this? Well, I've actually heard that I've heard that before in the in the past, just in passing with talking to people. So I mean, it's out there. It's just that if it it just seems like if it was actually that easy and that simplified that well, if they don't that, then why aren't they using it? I don't know. Well, probably because it probably shows up on their uh, on their list of frivolous arguments, and they charge you five thousand dollars if you try to claim it. Knowing them, they got forty. Was it forty nine pages of frivolous arguments? And it's probably listed in there, more than likely. You know what the lies? You know what the the advisory council is for the IRS? No. You know who the liaison is for the IRS? Is liaison? Liaison. Yes. Uh, no, I don't, but I know that what you're saying, liaison, yes. Okay, I'm personal friends of the head of the liaison and advisory council. Uh-huh. Okay. And I've so been doing this for 50 years, and I haven't met anybody that understands Class 5 gifts and estate taxes. Mm-hmm. Nobody. I'll tell you, it's pretty pretty crazy. Okay, I got well, I got another question. Uh, the HUD. Earlier in the conversation, you said something about human cap, human capital fund. That all the uh, different government agencies that have anything to do with housing, it all goes to HUD. HUD is the say? head of the human capital fund. That's what I thought you said. Well, <laughs> now Ben Carson is the head of it. How do you think he'll handle this information, or will he ever know this information? Because Ben Carson now is Dr. Ben Carson is the is the uh, head secretary now. Okay. As of yesterday, and I can't believe that he would ever put up with this if he if he knows the truth. He's a communist. <laughs> Pardon me. He's a communist. Oh no, ben, I'm thinking of that I, Bernie Sanders. Sorry, no, Ben Carson's the doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's the yeah. surgeon. Yeah. He actually ran for, pre- you know, he was running for president. I know, I like him. <laughs> oh, he's a great guy. I, I, and like I can't imagine he, he would oh. ever, if he was ever exposed to this information, that he would ever put up with it. I just can't imagine it. Well, I mean, uh, I've got to, you know, file a criminal complaint with uh, against uh, Obama, Holder, uh, Loretta Lynch, and Kikoskin. For the IRS sent it to the, we sent back. It, there was forty of us. We sent it to the uh, White House on the twentieth. Oh, is that? Are you with uh, Ellis and um, what was the other gentleman's name? I forget that that criminal complaint or lawsuit. It's a complaint, criminal complaint. Charged him with. Uh, huh. We did it under you, you know, Title uh, Eighteen, Subsection Four. If you don't. You know, if you don't go to somebody and if you witness a felony being committed and you don't report it yourself, you're you can be guilty of it. You know. Yeah, so Dave Merlin's what, doing one too. A that's complaint. It. That's the one. Oh, you're, that's the one. Okay. Yeah, we're in. There's like three or forty of us on it. Yeah. But well, good you know, luck. Well, we may send something to Mr. Ben Carson to let him not not a criminal complaint, but a, an information. You know, let him know what's going on. If, yeah. if, it's if he answers out. you back, call me. Let me know what he says. I'd yeah, be nobody curious. will write you back. I uh, won't we'll ever hear anything back on that criminal <laughs> complaint, probably. Uh, you answered one no. of my questions because I had one. Could a person end up in trouble filing these odd forms with, like, well, you know, I guess if 168 was talking about filing. I mean, I've heard of people going to jail for filing this stuff that they end up putting them in jail for filing false instruments or something. Was one of my questions. Yeah, yeah you got to yeah. be careful. You got to know I'm what you're doing. You. But um, you. you haven't answered, uh, Gene. Well, I'm gonna be on your on your class so, uh, when, or Tuesday, Mr. Keating. I, I can't wait. Well, I've been you know, an awful, you know an awful lot of information. I've got to give you credit. You really absolutely know just a ton of information. Well, that's because I read everything. Yeah, you're the you're the comprehension guy. You read it and you comprehend every word of it. <laughs> Which I'm not that guy, so you know, unfortunately, I don't have that gift like you. I have. can read eighteen thousand words a minute. 
My God. Eighteen thousand? Eighteen thousand. Oh my God. You heard me correct. I don't stutter when I talk. No, she can be hey, like I, a got, whole I, I got a question for you. In a minute. Pardon me? Uh, okay. Uh. I got I got one more question for you. I want your opinion on something. If IRS uh manual seventeen publication seventeen says that cost basis includes any money I spend and property I spend is a cost. It's right there in the publications. Uh, and in fact, in '93 and '94, they actually talked about to a fair market value <coughs> the cost of you're fair saying, market value. Are, are you, you're saying this is in a publication 17? Yeah, cost basis under cost basis. Um, it says right there that under cost basis, I can write off any money I spend in the performance of a you know of a function of of a working or something you know some kind of a transaction. Uh, and I can also write off any property that I invest into this thing, into the, uh, you know, the action. And the Supreme Court says that my labor is my most sacred property. And then I go to 26 U.S.C. subsection 83. Hey, what, what, what Supreme Court are you talking about? What Supreme Court? Yeah. The case? No, what Supreme Court are you talking about? Oh, United States Supreme Court. And wh- where is that located? Hang on a second. And okay, we're going to have to wrap it up, gentlemen. i got to go. I'll give you this one. Okay, let me, let, me, let me respond real quickly. That. Okay. That that's the that's the call the U, the Court of Justice. It's not the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay. Uh, in 1863, the United States Supreme Court of the United States for the District of Columbia was the United States District Court. It still is. It's the only Article Three court uh, on the planet. That that. High Court of Justice up on the hill is a is a court of justice. It's a, it's a legislative tribunal. It's not an Article Three court. So you're saying the United States Supreme Court is a legislative tribunal. It's not an Article Three. Right. Court. Right. Well, where where is the one Article Three court? It's uh, the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. It changed its name in 1948. I know Walter Cox personally, the Supreme Court Justice on the King's Bench. Well, Roger Taney wrote the Circuit Court for the Circuit Court of the United States. That was the Supreme Court. Then in 1863, they created the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. It was called the U. with small s, just like it is in Article Three. Small s Supreme Court, and it's an Article Three court. And then in 1940, that's when they changed all this. They changed the name from the U.S. Supreme Court to the United States. It was called District Court of the United States for the District of Columbia. Small d, small U, United States, and small letter C on the court. Then in 1940, after they did HAR 192, they changed it to United States District Court for the District of Columbia. And if you go, I w- I've been in all the courtrooms in that building. None of those court bu- bu- courtrooms have a yellow French flag in them. You go up on the, the Supreme, what you call the Supreme Court up on the hill, it's got mm-hmm. yellow French flags in all the courtrooms. Hmm. Well, so how do you get into the one that doesn't have the yellow French flag? Just walk into it. Well, how do you get a case in there? How can you bring a case? Well, yeah. you file it. You file it. File it in there. You got their address is on the uh, on the internet. Just type in United States District Court for the District of Columbia. I'll tell you where it is. United States District Court for the District of Columbia. That's the original U.S. Supreme Court of the United States. I did all the research for Senator, State Senator from Phoenix, Arizona. Mm-hmm. I have 
all the documentation right out of the D- D.C. code, District of Columbia code. Right. Well, okay, well, she's got to go. I'll jump off. There's probably yeah, one more as a matter of fact, I, I got disconnected from my Skype, and I'm on my cell phone right now. So. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> It's all right. We're going to have to call. end it, very gentlemen. Good call. It's been very interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Thank Angela. You. Thank you for coming yeah, appreciate, on. Really it's appreciate it. Important. Thank you, Mr. Keating. You're and welcome. I'll tell you, bid you good night. Okay, Gene, before we cut out, uh, cut out, I want you to give your email address because you didn't do it. People are saying they want your email address. So what is it? J- How can they contact you? Huh? J- J-E-A-N C E A T I N G at Gmail dot com. That's pronounced Gene Seating at Gmail dot com. Okay, we got it. J E A N C E A T I N G at Gmail dot com. Okay, great. You, got you, hey, you went you went a, you went a brand new car. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you so much. It's been fun, and I'm I'm, I'm hoping you'll come back and do it again. And uh, I'll uh, put your contact information for your classes up on the website. For those of you that want it, it's www.myprivateaudio.com. Click on the guest speakers link up at the top, and then click on Jean's name, and that'll take you to where the uh, – Information is to contact Brian, the the guy that's doing the the uh, setup for the calls. So what what do you do? Are you doing? Are they just calls or are they uh, with uh, visuals or what? Is it like webinar or what? Yeah, we do do a go to meeting. Go to meeting. Oh, okay, cool. That's very good. All right, great. All right, everybody, it's been fun. Uh, Have a great weekend, and uh, take care of each other. We'll see you next time. And uh, that's it for tonight. Good night.